Um, let me say a couple of things about this tutorial. One, we talked about um, uh, imposter syndrome right at the beginning of the course. Um, for the last three years, this has been taught by Jake Vanderplas, who like literally has written the book or several books actually on machine learning and tools in Python. So I cannot tell you how much of a fraud I feel standing up here. I mean, I'm not a machine learning researcher and presenting this, but you know, I, I think that the spirit is I feel like I know enough that I can hopefully uh, convey some of these ideas to you. Um, there are probably people in the room here who, who know some of this material much better than I do. Don't hesitate to jump in. If you think there's something I'm getting wrong or something you want to add, uh, feel free. Um, the other thing I'll say is that this uh, started its life as a tutorial for psychologists, um, and so no neuroscience at all. And I sort of thought for quite a while about how to, how to present it in this context. And I told you the idea of, of introducing neuroscience examples. Um, but I actually think that the, the, the examples I, I was using, which come from personality psychology, are both relevant actually in some ways because many people study individual differences in this community and also actually work better in some ways because <clears throat> introducing the imaging data adds a level of complexity that I think can obscure sort of the, 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 the core of machine learning concepts. Um, and so um, pretty much everything I'll talk about I think is going to translate very obviously and very clearly to machine learning or sorry, to, to uh, neuroimaging and neuroscience data. But the examples will be drawn, I think, almost exclusively from um, uh, personality psychology. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, <clears throat> so you've already seen Jupyter Notebooks throughout this, this uh, course so far. So you should be familiar with this. Uh, there are several ways to access these. If you have your Jupyter Hub up and running, as I said uh, a couple minutes ago, if you haven't restarted in a little while, I'd encourage you to do that. So you can go to File, Hub Control Panel, Stop My Server, uh, and then restart it. And that may take a few minutes, especially if everyone's doing it at the same time. Alternatively, you can go to the course, uh, for the, the tutorial repository on GitHub, which is at github.com slash neuroacademy slash intro underscore SK learn. And you can fire any of these up in binder. So if you, uh, this will not require you to play with the JupyterHub at all. Although stuff will probably take longer to run because the memory limitations um, are, are you know, more stringent here. And there you can just pop up these notebooks. Or of course you can clone and run it locally. So any of these is fine. Or you can just follow along without worrying about the code. That's, that's also OK. Um, I will run locally. Uh, there may also be some examples that are fairly computationally intensive. So that there might be cells that crash. Don't worry about that. You may be able to edit the parameters a little bit to get it to run. Um, I'm going to skip most of these preliminaries. You can read them later. But we're all already at the point where we have this installed either on Jupyter Hub or locally. So um, I don't need to tell you what you need to do in order to get the requirements running. Um, we can just jump in with the data. And, and this is a scikit-learn tutorial, I should also mention. So uh, I will be showing you how to use scikit-learn, which is a very widely used machine learning package in Python. But in some ways, the, the, the goal is as much conceptual as it is about the tools. And so uh, I'll be using scikit-learn as the primary vehicle to actually do machine learning analysis. Uh, but um, the focus really is sort of on high-level concepts. And hopefully, what you take away from this will generalize to other languages, other tools, et cetera. Um, so obviously, to do any kind of machine learning, we're going to need some data. Uh, in our case, we'll use empirical data. We'll also use simulated data here and there. Yeah? Oh, sorry. It's in the, uh, in the um, so it, it should be in the sklearn underscore tutorial. If you don't have that, then you'll need to, to, to do this. You'll need to restart the, oh, is anyone else having the same issue? Um, OK, well, I suggest you use, maybe use binder then. Um, it'll, I mean, experience will be pretty much the same. Um, and hopefully, we can take a look at that afterwards. So the data set, uh, so we, there's lots of data sets we could use, right? How many people are familiar with the iris data set? Yeah, OK. So I didn't want to use the IRIS data set for this reason. I mean, you could argue everyone knows it. Maybe we should use it. Um, but it, I don't know. I find it a little bit boring. And you've all seen it before. Um, so we're not going to use it. I will show you, however, how to, you could use it if you wanted to. So um, scikit-learn, like every Python package, is organized into a bunch of different modules. And one of those modules in scikit-learn is called datasets. Datasets includes all kinds of utilities for loading data, manipulating data. Uh, and so uh, for example, one of the sort of prepackaged um, uh, data sets you have is the iris data set and loading that so you can work with it is as simple as this right so data sets and you can use the load iris function and then that will load the iris data set into this variable now scikit-learn has its own uh, structure for for storing data scikit-learn tries to avoid heavy dependencies so they don't use things like pandas generally um, and so it's you can think of it as a dictionary and if you want to grab features 
uh, or variables, right? Features are just machine, machine learning speak for variables if you haven't encountered the term before. Um, then those are stored in the data, uh, uh, the data key and the target or the outcome variable, the thing you might want to predict, in this case the, the kind of iris it is, the kind of flower, is stored in target. So uh, if you wanted to, you could load that data this way. And then just to kind of give you a sense of what it looks like, although I think you've all seen this before, right? These are sort of the, 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 the predictive features you have available in the iris data set. Um, sepal length, sepal width, uh, petal length, petal width. And the idea is that in most tutorials you would sort of go through some examples and try to predict most commonly the, uh, the type or the, the species of iris from these features. And you've probably seen examples of that before. Um, but there are some limitations of that data set. Aside from the fact that everyone's seen it, um, it's actually not great if, if you kind of want to talk about issues related to sample size and some of the benefits of validation because it's quite small, both in terms of the number of features and in terms of the number of cases. It's like 150 observations and only four variables. And so uh, I wanted to pick a data set that has some properties uh, that are nice for our purposes, uh, one of which is that it's quite large, and the other is that you can sort of titrate it so, so you'll see that there's sort of um, there are lots of cases where performance scales in interesting ways as the size of the data set increases. And <clears throat> so what I, uh, what I decided to do is use um, a personality data set, uh, which comes from an online survey, the paper. Can people read this, by the way? Oops. Is that better? People? OK, all right. Um, from a study by uh, Johnson a few years ago, very simple, literally just 300 item questionnaire that's measuring something called the Big Five. How many people have heard of the Big Five? Okay, most of you. Big Five uh, this is sort of a, a model of personality that's very common. There are plenty of others. There's nothing terribly special about it, but it's popular. Has five major dimensions, neuroticism, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, conscientiousness. And uh, you can think of, and many measures sort of break each of those up into further facets. So there's five domains, 30 facets, each one's a little narrower. And then the, the measure itself has 300 items. And that's really nice for our purposes because it will let us sort of examine the relationship between like the model complexity and number of predictors and performance. So we will be able to do things like ask, you know, what happens if you use all 300 items? What happens if you only use the five sort of major domains, which are generated by scoring or by combining multiple items uh, and so on? Um, the data is originally in SPSS. SPSS is evil. If we see anybody using SPSS in this course, we're not going to say anything, but we, we'll just pretend we didn't see that. And, um, um, so I converted it to a uh, plain text tab delimited file that's bundled with this, so it's in the repository and it's also in Jupyter Hub. Um, one of the things I've done to avoid dealing with this whole kind of issue of how, you know, what do you do when you have missing values, and of course there are missing values when people are filling out a questionnaire online, uh, is just drop to all the observations that have at least one missing value. You should not do this with real data, right? List-wise deletion, which is what this is called, is generally not a good idea. You want to come up with some more sensible approach. But this is purely for sort of ex explanatory purposes. And so um, even after this, there's like 150,000 cases left. But just be aware that you know, if, if you really wanted to use this data for like a paper or something, you might want to do something a little smarter. So in, in pretty much all these notebooks, we'll start by reading in the data. Um, and this should work for you out of the box from this file using pandas, which I'll probably do a tutorial on next week. Pandas is a, a very uh, commonly used uh, data analysis library for Python. Uh, so here I'm just using this to read that in. And just to kind of give us a sense of what the data look like, here it is. These are the first five rows. So you have um, some demographic variables, sex, age, when the data was collected. Uh, and then after that, you have a whole bunch of personality variables on the right. Um, including the big five, and then the, these are sort of 30 facets and individual items. Any questions about this data? OK, like I said, I mean, nothing here is specific to personality. I mean, if you don't care about personality, you can just drop in any other data set you, you like. Um, if you are working on individual differences in the context of MRI or structural MRI, um, then you would often have very similar looking data sets, right? The, the columns, the features might be uh, sort of connectivity measures or what have you. Uh, and you might have still some of the same outcome measures uh, of interest. So in our case, we're probably going to focus primarily exclusively on the personality uh, data uh, uh, variables as our predictors. And um, what I did here, just to make it easier to get different sets of these items, is write a little function called get features that allows us to take that, that overall data set and pull out subsets of it. So we can easily pull out um, just the domains, just the facets, just all the 300 items and also uh, sample a subset. So this, I'm not going to go through the code, 
But just when you see this get features thing pop up, just be aware that it's a little helper I wrote that just helps us more easily subset data. Um, and it, th this is a generally, I, I think, a fine and useful thing to do. If you have a data set and you're going to be consistently grabbing different subsets of the data, it's often quite helpful to write a helper that can grab the subset you need or some random subset uh, fairly easily. Um, and so, for example, if we want to get just the big five domains, we can call this get features thing. We pass in the data. We say we want the domains, and maybe we only want 1,000 observations. And so that's what we get back. And so now we can easily pull out a subset of the data. So that's fine for predictors. Uh, what about an outcome? Um, so for our purposes today, uh, I thought we'd, we'd use age. So this data set has age, and that's, age is kind of a nice variable because it's sort of intuitive. You understand what it means. It's a continuous variable, which will be important. Um, and it bears some relationship to personality, which is helpful if we want to build predictive models. It's kind of nice when your model can actually capture some variation in the thing you're trying to predict. Um, so just to kind of show you that this is true and there's some relationship, here's the correlation over the entire 150,000 uh, subject data set between each of these big five traits and age. Uh, and you can see that one of them in particular, like conscientiousness, is actually fairly, I would call this a strong correlation, you may not. Um, we'll come back to this point. Um, certainly a non-trivial correlation with conscientiousness, and to some degree, most of the other traits, maybe not openness, okay? So there are, there are relationships there, and that's probably sufficient to get us thinking that maybe we can build a predictive model and try to capture more of the variation than, you know, just what you get from this zero-order correlation, which is already like 4% of the variance, which is not trivial. Um, okay, so that's just the bare bones sort of setting up, uh, showing you the data, and kind of giving you a sense of what we're trying to do here. Any questions before we start with some core concepts? Okay. Uh, and I should say I have, was there a question? Sorry, it's, um, yeah, <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's the course, the course organization, NeuroAcademy, uh, slash intro underscore sklearn. And yeah, if you're having any trouble at all or, or you just want to clone the notebooks, um, then you can either do that, obviously, here, or you can launch Binder, and that will run without any further configuration. Um, there are, I think, uh, yeah, there are six notebooks here. There's no way I'm going to get through all six. When I've done this before, it's been a four-hour uh, uh, workshop. Although this is, I think, um, that was for psychologists, and you guys are mostly neuroscientists, right? So I assume um, a little more background. Um, I'll try to cover the first, uh, well, two, three, four now. I'll feel pretty good if we can get through those. If we can get to model selection, great. If we don't, and if this is new to you, I would suggest maybe working through them. Um, and I'll obviously be around. I'm happy to, to chat about it. Um, if, if this is all you know, very familiar to you, and for some of you will be, then of course um, you know, that, that's fine. Maybe you can do some email and catch up on the stuff you haven't had time to work on the last couple of days. Uh, all right. OK, so let's talk about core concepts in machine learning. Let me just, uh, just clear all this output. Um, OK, so. Probably by now all of you are at least a little bit familiar with Python, and so this kind of thing probably shouldn't shock you, right? At the, what I've done is at the top of each of these notebooks, I've put um, all the imports, so a, a cell that contains all the different modules, or different chunks of code we'll be using, except for scikit-learn. So because we're going to talk specifically about all the scikit-learn tools and functionality, I've, 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 I've imported the scikit-learn stuff as we introduce it, just so it's clear to you where it's coming from. But all this stuff we'll kind of use in the background. So NumPy is the numerical analysis library, Python, JB talked about uh, yesterday. Pandas, uh, we'll talk about next week at some point, useful for data analysis and uh, um, all kinds of stuff. Uh, Mat, uh, Matplotlib, I think Kirsty probably talked about in visualization. And um, I'm just using the default style here for plots. We can change the appearance if we want. And again, this is our little helper for taking subsets of the data. But you can ignore this. I mean, for our purposes, none of this matters, just so you kind of have a sense of what the, the components, what, what, what the, the, really the, the numerical analysis ecosystem in Python involves. And it's almost always like these three things, plus in this case, scikit-learn. Um, so once again, we're going to read our data in. This will take a few seconds. Um, and while that's going on, we can actually, I mean, now is a good time to ask, what is machine learning, right? Like, well, this is about machine learning. You probably all have some vague sense. Um, the definition I'll use is the following. Machine learning is the field of science or engineering, depending on who you ask, uh, that seeks to build systems capable of learning from experience, right? So it's a, it's a very broad definition. Um, and what you consider machine learning varies from person to person. Uh, I would say the following two elements are, are common to nearly all, maybe not, maybe most, let's say, uh, machine learning applications. First, 
the emphasis is on developing algorithms that can learn autonomously or semi-autonomously, right? So the idea is you're not writing sort of rule-based explicit systems that say when you encounter this kind of a pattern in the data, you give this response. Somewhere in there, there's some, got to be some element of learning where the, the algorithm learns, you know, it, it learns its own parameters in some sense from the data it sees. And the other part of this is the, certainly more so than sort of uh, 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 in sort of classical fields of science where the focus often is on inferential statistics and understanding what the model is doing internally. What is the structure of the model? How does that capture what's going on out in the world? The focus tends to be uh, much more strongly on some predictive objective metric, meaning uh, I'm not saying that, that you know, people doing machine learning don't care about, about the structure of models, but to a larger extent at least, it tends to be a focus on what can the model do and can we find some objective target we care about and use that as, as the measure of how well we're doing in some sense, which is not often or not always the case uh, in, in science. Questions? Um, right, so that's sort of machine learning as a discipline. Why scikit-learn? Why, why, you know, there's lots of packages. Many of you have probably used other packages. Uh, why do we, in this course, uh, and in the community more generally, emphasize scikit-learn? There's several reasons. Uh, one is it has a very simple, elegant API. So the interface right, the, 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 for interacting with models and with data is really quite elegant. It's very simple. And so it's easy to learn, uh, not much of a learning curve. Um, and it makes it very easy, as you'll see, to sort of plug and play and you try out different models and, and, and different things. Another uh, uh, point in its favor is it has fantastic documentation. So um, typically when people ask me, you know, what, should I, what, what book or, or you know, course can you recommend to learn machine learning, I usually point them to this like you learn documentation because it's, it's fantastic on several levels. You have a quick start which covers machine learning concepts. Incidentally, it's not just about the software. It also walks you through conceptually what, what the problems are. Uh, I, there's a great user guide, lots of tutorials. And so for pretty much sort of any aspect of machine learning, at least that's covered in scikit-learn, there are some gaps. Uh, this is a really good place to go. And almost every example has code. All the code that generates the figures you see is included. And so there's very rarely a case where um, you know, it's, it's unusual, I think, to read the scikit-learn documentation and, and, and not be able to sort of grasp what the, the tool does because there's really uh, excellent examples throughout. Um, and the last thing is that scikit-learn has really good support for all kinds of machine learning algorithms. There is one noticeable gap, which is deep learning. So by design, uh, scikit-learn does not do deep learning. And Ariel will talk about other, other packages uh, you could use to do deep learning. But for most other things, there's, there's reasonably good support, and the implementations are generally quite efficient. So people spend a lot of time uh, implementing many algorithms so that, that for most things, the scikit-learn implementation is going to be pretty performant, and it fits into this sort of ecosystem of, of estimators that have all the same interface. So it's, for many reasons, I think it's a really nice uh, package for machine learning. And of course, it's also written in Python. And since Python is, uh, to some degree at least, a lingua franca in, in, uh, in data science, if you're already working with NumPy, Pandas, et cetera, it's very natural to, uh, to use scikit-learn. Um, any questions? But, and I, but I emphasize, of course, like nothing, we, we, nothing says you have to use scikit-learn. If you want to work in Carrot, in R, next week, or for the rest of your life, that's totally fine. Right? Hopefully the concepts you learn here will still apply, uh, and you'll get something uh, from this. Uh, okay. So um, there's many things we could say about scikit-learn, but since we're short on time, I really kind of want to focus on one particular aspect. And I think this is probably the thing that, more than anything else, makes us a very popular package. And that's the, uh, the, the, the estimator interface. Right? So scikit-learn has this concept of an estimator. Um, and an estimator in statistics, so the Wikipedia definition is there, is just a, a rule for calculating an estimate of a given quantity based on some, some data. And that's pretty much the definition in scikit-learn too. Right? So it's very closely tied to what this object does. It takes in some data and it estimates some quantity. It really says very little other than that. Um, in terms of code, what this means is even though there are hundreds and hundreds of different estimators you could use, they all have minimally the same interface. Now they, all, they can have you know, additional components that, that, that not every, not, they don't all share. Um, but to a first approximation, there's kind of other subtleties. Um, every estimator in scikit-learn implements the following two things, the two methods, fit and predict. That's what it is to be an estimator in scikit-learn. You have to have a, 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 an object that can fit data, and then it can, once it's done the fitting, it can predict some values for new data. Um, and so any, any time you see an estimator in scikit-learn, you pretty much know you can call these things, whatever else they may be able to do. So let's see this in action. We can just generate a little bit of random data here. 
We'll use NumPy uh, to generate uh, two vectors with 40 elements. And if we just want to plot, and so these are sort of moderately correlated. If we plot the relationship, the scatter plot, that's what it looks like. Right? You've all seen this kind of thing before, no surprises. Um, now, the question we're asking is, um, you know, let's say we want to capture, let's say we want to predict the, the, the scores on the y from x. Right? We want to build a model that best, where best we'll say is defined by some least squares criterion. There are other ways to define best, right? In this case, we'll say we want to minimize the, the error um, from the, the straight line, we'll focus on linear regression, uh, the straight line of best fit to all of these individual observations. Right? And so the question is, how do we do that? Well, there's lots of least square solvers. You can write your own, you can use NumPy, um, you can use other packages. We, this is a scikit-learn tutorial, so I will show you how this is done in scikit-learn. And it's really very simple. Um, we find, so we need to know one thing, which is where in the scikit-learn package is the linear regression estimator housed. And it turns out, along with many other models, linear models, it's housed in a linear model um, module. And in general, I think the organization of code in scikit-learn is quite good. Usually you can intuit, once you're familiar with the package, where something is going to be. But you'll see that, you know, I'm, I'm pulling, I, I'm importing linear regression, but there are lots and lots of different linear models for both classification and regression distinction I'll talk about here. And um, the nice thing is you could, it is really plug and play, you could pick any one of these and just replace linear regression there and, and you know, everything else would, would flow uh, equally well. But in our case, we'll use linear regression. And all we have to do to initialize this, this, uh, uh, this estimator, in this case, our linear regression model is initialized just, just that way, right? So this is a Python class. It doesn't have to take any, there's no mandatory arguments we need to pass. We run that cell and we now have an instantiated estimator ready to, to, to do ordinary least squares estimation for us. Uh, we could have passed, there are some arguments that we could pass if we wanted to. So for example, you can ask, if you set normalize equals true, then when you pass data in, it'll be first, it'll first be normalized before the, the fitting happens. Uh, you can drop the intercept if you want. So there are some options, but by, for linear regression, you generally won't use them, I think, in most cases. So, okay, so we have this estimator. It's sitting there. Uh, now what? Well, so now we're ready to use that fit predict pattern I mentioned, right? So now we want to fit some data. So remember, we have this x and y data we created, and we just pass to the model we call fit, and we pass in these two arguments, x and y and in that specific order. So x is always the set of predictors, could be one variable, but typically it's a matrix. Um, and y is the, in, uh, uh, in this case, the, the, the outcomes or the scores we're trying to predict, the labels. And so we're passing in the x values here and we're predicting the y's, and that's all. You run that, and you get some information just to kind of inform you what the estimator looks like right now and what parameters are set. <clears throat> I mean, nothing else happens because fitting doesn't produce some summary or anything, right? It's just we've done the fitting internally. Now, of course, at this point, you probably want to do something with, with the, this fitted model. One thing we could do is we could reach into that model, into that object, and say, you know, what are the parameters that have been estimated? And so in the case of linear regression, the parameters we have access to are the intercept and the coefficients. Um, and we'll just print those, and so you can see that here the, the intercept parameter is estimated at negative 0.56, and there's the coefficient. Uh, typically, you'll have more, vari more predictor variables, and so the coefficients array will be as long as the number of, of, of uh, columns in your X matrix. But in this case, we only have one. And the underscore here just denotes, it's just scikit-learn's convention for showing you that these are estimated from data. So if this didn't have that underscore, that would mean it's a parameter that's set at the level of the estimator, so when you initialized it, and you can see that up here, right? So, you, you know, uh, for example, fit intercept doesn't have that trailing uh, underscore, and that's because it's an estimator level parameter. It has nothing to do with the data. Um, does that make sense? Any questions? Okay. Um, now, this is great if you want to use those coefficients, and you can, of course, construct the prediction equation yourself here. Um, you might go and do some other interesting stuff with that, dimensionality reduction or something. But very often, you just want to generate predicted scores, right? You don't necessarily even care to see those coefficients yourself. Um, and so, uh, so scikit-learn has, has taken the liberty of, of making it easy for you to do that with the predict method. So I mentioned fit and predict, sort of, or tandem, right? Um, once you fitted that model, you can now predict new scores. And all you need to do that is call predict and pass in some x values. 
And the x values have to have the same number of columns, right? So you can't fit a regression with six variables and then try to pass in four and expect that to work. You have to have the same variables. Um, but they don't have to be the same, or you know, they don't have to be new scores, or they can be, you can pass in exactly the same x as you trained, or you can pass in new scores. They just have to have the same shape. Every row has to have the same structure, right? So that the, the, the model, the shape of the model matches the shape of the data. And so all we're doing here is we're saying, hey, model, now that you're fitted, pre please predict new y scores given the x's, and in this case we're just feeding the same x's right back in, and we store those in this uh, y predicted variable. And if we want to look at that, we can, sure enough, right, so this doesn't mean much, but these are the predicted scores. Given that simple linear model, these are the y's we would predict given the x's. And of course there will be some error, there will be some deviation between the, the true scores and these predicted scores, which we'll talk about uh, shortly. Uh, any questions? Um, all right, so now what we can do is we can, we've had this fitted model, we can use this predict function to generate a regression line that we can drop on top of our scatter plot. And so we're just going to take the range of the data and we'll take sort of a, a linearly spaced uh, points along that line and we'll predict the values that we see and then we can, we can just plot that, that uh, line on top of our data. And so that's the line of best fit. Right? That line minimizes the, the, squared, the sum of squared uh, deviations from the individual data points to the regression line. So that's it, right? You're done. We can, we can stop here. Like now you know how to do machine learning and scikit-learn. And that's it. It only takes three lines, right? So here's the whole example again, just so you can see. Uh, in just three lines, initialize the estimator, fit to some data, generate predicted scores. Done. That's all there is to it, right? Obviously, there's a lot more to it, and you wouldn't want to just stop there. But that should give you the sense. I mean, this is partly why scikit-learn is so appealing, right? As long as you have your data in the sort of matrix form that you expect, or you have sort of observations uh, in, in the, the rows and variables in the columns, and you pass in a vector of, uh, of scores or outcomes you want to predict, all of these, or you know, pretty much all of these algorithms are going to work the same way. So you could have replaced linear regression with lots of other things and, um, and generated predictions just as easily. Um, and everything else we'll talk about is really sort of addressing complexities around this sort of basic conceptual framework. Um, okay, any questions? All right, I'll stop asking if everybody has questions, just put up your hand at any point, um, or throw stuff. Um, okay, so, all right, so that's, that's the scikit-learn estimator interface, and armed with that, now we can sort of talk about the main classes of problems in machine learning. Uh, and there's sort of two large classes, and you've, you've probably, how many people are familiar with the distinction between supervised and unsupervised learning? Okay, so it may be like two-thirds. Okay, so I, I will spend some time on it just so it's, cause it's, it's pretty important. So um, supervised problems are problems where you know the solution in some sense, right? You know the, the you, have, you know, have access to the ground truth at least for the training data set. So some examples of supervised learning problems are, you know, determining whether or not email is spam. In order to train a model, you have to know, right? It'd be very odd to hand someone a bunch of emails, say, look, we don't know if this is spam or not, you have to somehow magically determine that, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's a, an unusual problem. Um, predicting a person's age from personality, which is what we'll spend a lot of time on. Uh, again, you know the person's age and you have some other information you're, you're leveraging. Uh, diagnosing schizophrenia or assigning people to, you know, schizophrenia or, or, or healthy control uh, based on genetic markers or some other data. The common, the common point here is that we have access to the outcome that we care to predict, right? Um, and that's distinguished from unsupervised learning where you're sort of just trying to discern interesting or useful structure in the data, but nobody has told you what the ground truth is, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, within supervised learning, we can just further distinguish between two classes of problems, classification and regression. Again, I think many of you will be familiar with this distinction. Um, so the main difference here really is just that the, the, the type of the outcome variable. So if the, the outcomes or the labels we're trying to predict are continuous, then it's regression. If they're discrete, uh, it's uh, classification. So age is a, is a continuous outcome, right? You can be younger or older, and that varies along some, some continuous dimension. And so when you try to generate predictions, you kind of recognize that um, it's not good enough to say, like, are you young or old? Right? You kind of want to know, like, you know, well, how, I mean, what is the exact age that this model predicts? And the, the error metric can also be continuous. You could be sort of more wrong or less wrong. Um, whereas with, with, with uh, discrete uh, or with, with classification problems, the outcome is, is discrete. So if I hand you a bunch of brains and say, look, these came from either dogs or cats, that's not really a, there's no, the variable's not continuous. You can't be half dog, half cat. 
right? And so in that situation, um, your goal is to predict which class, which particular class the, the observation falls in. Uh, now, having said that, uh, there are, there's a class of problems where you, you can do multi-class classification. Right? So there can be cases where you have multiple labels, um, but the idea is that the outcome variable is discrete. And so you, you, know, you might want to predict multiple, you know, whether something is uh, a dog or a cat, and also whether it's relatively large, or I shouldn't, that's not a good example, um, whether it's uh, an animal that's been adopted or not um, simultaneously, but your, each of those dimensions individually you can think of as a classification problem. Um, we'll give an example of each one. I will focus, um, well actually no, I think I talked about both of these. I'll spend less time with unsupervised uh, machine learning, mainly because it was covered in a fair amount of detail this morning, and so you've already seen uh, quite a bit of unsupervised uh, learning. Um, okay, so let's, let's take regression first. So you've already seen actually a, an example of regression. You saw supervised learning in that, in that toy example just up there. Um, and all we're going to do here is, re is replace that, that toy data with, with, with a real data set, with our personality and age data. So in this case, we're going to come back to our age prediction problem. And now we're going to ask, again, just using a simple linear regression model for the moment, how well can we capture age? How well can we predict age uh, given, let's say, just the big five? We'll worry about other you know, the facets and individual items later. But just using these five variables, right? how much of the variation can we ex explain with a linear combination of of variables. Um, and you'll notice there's essentially no difference between this code and what you saw earlier. This is just getting the data we want, but it's these th three lines are identical, right? No difference for real data or fake data. We run that and it's pretty much instantaneous and now we have a fitted model. Okay, great. Um, now what? Right, so now we need to talk about how you would actually evaluate this. So typically you want to know, well, is this a good model? Right? Does it make good predictions, bad predictions? Um, and for that we need to talk about some, we have to have some performance metric. Right? So we've got predictions, we have the true scores, and presumably we want to relate these in some way and try to understand uh, why or how, how, how well our model fits and, and if it doesn't fit well, what can we do to improve it? Um, now, at this point, you, you sort of see a, a, a sort of a bifurcation between sort of how um, many psychologists and neuroscientists are used to thinking about statistics versus how people tend to think about machine learning, right? So many people at this point want to say, well, now I need to know if it's significant, right? Is there a statistically significant relationship between the overall model and the outcome? Like, are we predicting, you know, are we predicting age better than we would be if we just had like five random variables? Um, and do we want to, maybe we want to know, like, what are the individual variables doing? You know, is conscientiousness more important than other variables and so on? You are not going to get that here. Uh, you can have it if you want. It's not like you can't get this information in Python. Um, you can. There's this other package called stats models, um, which is sort of vaguely R-like. It's the closest approximation to this, much of the stuff in base R. And so if you are familiar with, with, uh, with uh, uh, our formulas, look into notation, right, this will look familiar. So here's how you might fit sort of a, a linear regression model using stats model. Here's the formula. We're predicting age from these five dimensions. And we run that, and now you, you feel good, right? You see, you're used to seeing this. And you're like, oh, good, yes, there's an R squared. And uh, oh, look, you have nice p-values for each of the individual dimensions. I feel good. The world is, the world is whole again. Right? We have p-values. Not surprisingly, in this case, everything is significant because you have 150,000 observations. And I think JB uh, Pauline may tell you on Friday a little bit more about why you might want to reconsider your relationship with p-values. Um, and part of that is this, is that when you have a really large data set, which you want to have, right, generally speaking, everything is significant. So there's not much information to be had here. We know that all these things are related to age in some non-zero way. Um, in any case, I'm not going to talk about much of this at all. In fact, you'd have to work fairly hard to get this out of scikit-learn. You'd have to construct this yourself from the raw underlying quantities. There's no sort of summary method that does this for you. And the reason is because philosophically, machine learning is not well aligned with this kind of approach. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. It's just not what, what uh, for the most part, machine learning is about. Instead, the focus tends to be on prediction and on how well the model uh, in the aggregate uh, can do. And so to the degree that the model does better on that metric, we say it's a better model. And if it doesn't, then we might ask, what can we do to improve it? Are there other estimators that we could use? Can we parameterize it slightly differently? And so on. Uh, again, I'm not, I want to be clear. I'm not suggesting either that you have to ignore this or that you have to sing single-mindedly focus and obsess on like, you know, one particular quantity. That's not the point. The point is that there's a sort of a, a, a different mentality, I think, that comes with doing machine learning um, that's, that's sort of in some ways orthogonal to the way we think about many of these questions in uh, sort of tr science traditionally. 
they're not antagonistic. They're, they're either complementary or sort of just sort of parallel uh, trains in the night, if you like. Um, OK. So with that in mind, we do want to have some metric that we're using to evaluate this model. And actually, this one is not a bad one, r squared. Right? So that will be familiar to many people. Um, the, it's called the coefficient of determination also. Right? So r squared uh, is a nice measure for this particular application because it, it, it's, it's defined in terms of relative variation. So it tells you the proportion of variation in the observed outcome that you're capturing using your, your fitted model. Uh, so you can think of it as a 1 minus the, the uh, sum of squares, the residual sum of squares. So if you take your model, right, you generate the predictions, subtract the predicted scores from the true scores, the, the square the differences are the, the residual sum of squares, how bad your model is, right? So how, how much variance you're not able to capture. And the ratio of that to the total variation in the outcome, um, if you subtract that from one, gives you the, the coefficient of determination. If this is 1, that's the saying that there's no error. Your model is perfect. Anything below that, and you're doing less and less well. I'll come back to, to you know, what bad performance means for this metric. I'm not saying r squared is a, is a wonderful metric everywhere. Uh, it is a relative metric, so if you care about absolute deviation, maybe you think, well, you know, in the case of age, we have some intuition about what it means to be like 10 years off versus 20 years off, so maybe you want to replace this with mean squared error. Fine, you can do that. As you'll see, that's very easy to do in scikit-learn because the interface, again, is sort of uh, very simple and elegant. Uh, but in this case, we'll focus on r squared for the most of this uh, tutorial. And so we can ask, like, how well did we do? And just as with the estimator interface, like I learned, makes it really easy to evaluate performance uh, or to score the, the model. There's a metrics module. In this case, we're going to import R2 score, R squared score. But as uh, for most other things, there's lots of options there. Many of these will only make sense for classification. Some of them make sense for regression. Uh, I have no idea what most of these are. But they're all do well documented, and you can go and read up on them. The, the critical point to note is that they also have a uniform interface. So each one of these things, maybe not all of them, but certainly most of them, expect this kind of, uh, this kind of input. Right? You will always pass the true scores first, and then the predictions. And then internally, some kind of computation happens, and then out comes the, the, the score. And in this case, we get the same answer as we do from stats models, which is good. I mean, it's the same R squared. And so we see that we can explain about 11, 12% of the variance in age just using people's uh, big five scores. Now, as I mentioned, if you, if you want, you're welcome to, to, to replace this. You can just re remove this and you know, put like mean squared error in or something and so on, and, and you will get out uh, a different quantity that will give you some other intuition, presumably, about how well the model is doing. For convenience, though, so this is not like this is a lot of code, right? But for convenience, if you're, if you're, in many cases, you sort of have an implicit, uh, you, you know, you kind of expect the, 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 the default performance metric, if you like, to be defined by the problem. Like in the context of regression, certainly linear regression, R squared is usually the, the sort of most natural metric. And so every estimator has, maybe not every, I think most of them at least do, has a default scoring algorithm built into it. And so if we had just initialized this, fit the model, we could have just said score. So the score method, in this case, by default, or is, is R squared. Uh, if you just want to use R squared, you don't, you're not looking for some other metric, then you could have just passed the data in. You don't even have to call predict. You don't have to get the predicted scores out. In, internally, scikit-learn will do this for you. So the estimator, when you call score, will say, oh yeah, okay, I predict the Y scores. And then it just passes them to R squared score. So the exact same thing is going on internally, but it's a little less code to worry about. And so we run this, and again, same answer, which is what we should get. So really, in, in three lines of code, we can go from, we can run a linear regression and get out some estimate of how well that model fits our data. Um, any question about regression? And I'll talk about all kinds of, complex, uh, or sort of complexities here in a little bit, but this is sort of the, just the bare bones. Um, conceptually, this is what we do when we're doing a regression. We have a continuous outcome. We have some model. It can have an arbitrarily complex internal structure. It just has to take in one or more predictor variables and generate continuous scores as its prediction. And then you can evaluate that in some way based on some metric like R squared. Right? That's sort of the general idea here. Um, OK. All right. So let's look at classification now. So as I mentioned, the only difference really between classification and regression is the nature of the variable you're trying to predict. And here the labels are discrete. So um, I already mentioned the example. Maybe you're trying to predict like what species uh, a brain comes from. It's a classification problem. Uh, often, and I'll, I will do this here, 
Often you can turn regression problems into classification problems by discretizing the data. In fact, well, it's always true. You can always take a continuous variable and turn it just by chopping it up into arbitrarily many uh, categorical variables. This is generally a really bad idea for several reasons I won't get into it. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this here for sort of because we already have the data set, it's easy. And also it's nice because it makes it clear how there's a very close relationship between regression and classification. Right? So they're not like completely different things. Um, most of the estimators that you use for regression can be made to work for classification and vice versa. Not all, but most of them. Um, you don't want to do this in general. Right? If you have data that's naturally continuous, don't discretize it. But I will do that here because it just it sets up the problem nicely. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to take our age variable and we will just bin it. We're going to split it into young and old. And we're going to do that by saying everyone under 18, so this is online data, there are children in there apparently as well, is young. If you're under 18, you're young. If you're over 40, you're old. You may not be happy with that. Pierre's definitely not happy with that. I'm not happy with that. I'm very close to, to old. Um, this is one of the reasons why you should, just, you, should, you should now appreciate why it's actually a bad idea. I mean, there's other reasons why you lose information. This is one of the reasons why it's really a bad idea to discretize continuous data because now you need to attach labels. And attaching labels is a really, really dangerous thing. There's all kinds of evil psychology involved in putting names on variables that completely changes how you think about a problem, even though nothing has actually changed in terms of the underlying data. So I will talk about these as young and old groups, but be aware, right? You, you, you remember, like if you're reading a paper and someone does any size, you're like, these are not old people, I hope. Right? You, you people are pretty young. Maybe you do think like 40 is, is pretty old. Um, OK, so, so all we're doing here is we're taking that data set. We'll take a, a smaller sample of it just to keep things tidy. And I'm setting up this age group variable here. It's going to be set to NAN, right? So it's invalid if it's between 18 and 40. If it's under 18, value is 0. Over 40, it's 1. And then I'm just going to remove all the, the missing values. So we're only keeping the, the people who are. So this is an extreme group's design in some sense, if you think 40 is an extreme age. And it's roughly balanced, which is why I chose these cutoffs originally. Um, so we have a few thousand people who are either under 18 or over 40. And now we can ask, um, what do you know about their age if you know their personality? And for plotting purposes, it's hard to visualize in like you know even five dimensions, right? So some of you might be good at it. I can't visualize above two really. So we'll just generate a nice 2D plot um, where we're plotting the group. So zero is young, one is old, as a function of consciousness, conscientiousness score. Conscientiousness, I, I should mention, is sort of uh, well, you, it's what the English word means, right? It's like how good you are about meeting your responsibilities and doing what you should. An extroversion is how sociable you are, how outgoing, and. What's kind of interesting here, I think this is actually a nice, a nice kind of example. Um, these variables individually, and you saw it, are not very strongly correlated. You might say like the strong, your consciousness is like a 0.25 correlation in the population, which you might not think of as very strong. But if you take a bunch of variables that individually are not very strongly correlated with the outcome, right, and you use the information, uh, use all the information you can, you actually can start to separate. Uh, groups often better than you might think. So even though these two variables are, are individually fairly modestly correlated, and you look at this and you see very clearly, right, these, these distributions are quite separable. Most of what's going on up here, most of the people who have extroversion who, who scores um, above, let's say, three, and conscientiousness scores below around three are young. And the opposite is true down here. So this, I think, I find this really kind of remarkable that, you know, you could talk about like how hard it is to predict things, and many things really are hard to predict. On the other hand, this looks like a very tractable classification problem. We're not going to be able to classify age perfectly, but even just, you know, if, you, if I asked you, like, you know, just put down a straight line with no further complexity, just like a single straight line, you're going to do reasonably well if you just put one along the diagonal, right? You'll get most of the people who are young uh, in one, or I should say under 18, in one box, and most of the people who are over 40 in the other. So that's the nature of the problem. And of course, we have more than just these two variables to work with. We have minimally five, but we have potentially up to 300 items we could use. But that's the, the problem. The classification problem is how do we come up in, in two dimensions with decision boundaries that, that, that maximally separate the two classes, right? We want to basically uh, separate this. You can also see that we're not going to be able to do this perfectly. Why? Because uh, the distributions do overlap, and there's points in space where you have young and old participants right on top of each other. And it's very hard to imagine an algorithm even with more dimensions that would be able to separate them, well, at least with the kind of personality data we're working with. So nobody expects, I think, or should expect to get like 100% accuracy here. But it's clear that there is some, some substantial information there uh, uh, to be utilized. Any questions? OK. So just as in the case of regression, there's literally hundreds of, of estimators we could use, uh, many, many of them built into scikit-learn. Um, 
For illustration purposes, I thought I'd talk about one in particular, which is something called K-nearest neighbors. Uh, how many people are familiar with K-nearest neighbors? Okay, quite a few, but many people are not. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about it briefly. Um, <clears throat> so KNN is nice because um, it doesn't actually have an internal data model. It's a very simple algorithm um, um, that often does quite well, and depending on the size of the data and how, what approximations you want to make, can be quite efficient. Uh, it's conceptually very easy to understand, so here's the idea. I hand you a data set, and I say, um, please use k-nearest neighbors to, uh, well, I really hand you two data sets. I give you, you know, a set of observations, um, and you take them and you store them, and I come along and I say, okay, now I need you to predict the, the class, or the age group, let's say, for this new person you haven't seen before. And what you do is you say, okay, let me take the dimensions I know about for all these people, the ones, the, the training set and this person you just handed me. In our case, let's say it's conscientiousness and extroversion. And you set up a space, could be a Euclidean space, where you just can quantify the distance from every observation to every other person. And you identify the people who are closest in that space to that, the target observation. You pick the number, it could be the five closest people, five neighbors, 10. And once you've done that, so here's an example, right? We're, we're trying to figure out what is, the, what is the label for this circle? It could be either a square or a triangle. Um, if your, your, uh, your value of k, the number of neighbors is three, these are the three closest observations, and then you just take the consensus. So in this case, you know, there's more triangles than squares, so you say, we'll just say that this person, this circle becomes a triangle. Notice that if we picked a different number, a different k, like five, we would have attached a different label because now we have more people within that boundary uh, <clears throat> that are squares. And so we would have said that that circle should be labeled a square. But that's the basic idea here. It's really quite simple, it's elegant, and it works quite well in many settings. Question, yeah. And I have a question. Uh, in this feature, it assumes that different features, they have equal methods <coughs> for finding the closest neighbors. And, uh, yeah, so I mean, th th that does not have to be true, right? So you can make different assumptions. So in this particular example you're staring at, um, uh, perhaps that's true, but nothing prevents you from scaling dimensions or weighting dimensions differently. You can do that. You can also, and I'll come back to this, you can also weight points based on the distance, right? So maybe you think, we shouldn't just decide, are all the points inside or outside this boundary? You might say, well, this one is closer than this one, so this one should weigh more heavily, right? So you can make all kinds of different assumptions. When you're talking about mm -hmm. distance, yeah. you uh, can put it also like a Euclidean distance taken off. You can calculate whatever you want, right? So any distance matrix will do. How we can make a choice for the distance? That's, I mean, the, 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 the same is true for all these things. How do you make a choice for K? I mean, how do you make a choice whether you should wait by distance? Um, I will talk about model selection if we get there later, um, but nothing here commits you to that, right? So the conceptually, the only point I want to make about K and N in this context is you're, you're, sort of, you're deciding which observations count as neighbors based on whatever distance metric you like. Typically, it'll be Euclidean, um, but it doesn't have to be. And then you're, you're using those neighbors to determine what label to assign. Um, and I think there's questions to be asked about, well, how exactly do you parameterize that, the, the, the classifier? And I'll show you a couple of things you can play with. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I will probably butcher it if I try, quite frankly. Um, so, I mean, I'll, actually, do you, would you like to give a, de a definition? Um, so I just think this is probably what I'm mentioning here, that what we're doing is effectively just going straight lines to the I mean, so I mean, that's going to be true, but that's not specific to KNN, right? I mean, so, okay, so no relation to this last question. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and most I think most of the models that that, that 
you probably will be working with are discriminative models, right? Um, 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 okay, so all right. So the way we're going to apply this in Scikit-Learn is um, essentially the same as we've run. We've just set up our, K, our x here. Now we're only going to use these two variables so that we can visualize the result, conscientiousness and extraversion. We're going to predict our age group values now, which are discrete. Um, and the only parameter we're going to play with here is the number of neighbors, which you saw can have an influence on the, the solution. Um, same kind of principle. The classifier is basically stored in, in this case, in the neighbors module. Um, we initialize the classifier. We set that and neighbors parameter. And I'll come back to this. In this case, we're setting uniform weight, which, which, which basically means that we're not, we don't care about the distances from these observations to the, the target observation. Um, if it's in the circle, it counts equally. So it's just a popularity contest, essentially. Um, and so we'll fit that. Nothing happens, right? But internally, now the model has come up with some assignment, or at least it, it's, it's set up so that now if you give it new observations, it, can, it has data it can refer that to and decide like, you know, where these labels go. Um, and now we can actually feed it back data. In this case, we'll pass the same observations in. And here's what this plot looks like. So this, is the, this shows you the decision boundaries. And so the idea here is every point, this is the same scatter plot as before, um, every, every point is a, a, an observation. And the color, the background color shows you what the classifier, you know, what, what, what part of the space the classifier would assign to um, either young and red or old in blue, okay? And so you can see that this probably aligns fairly well with your intuition, which is that, you know, there's like a roughly a, like clear separation of young into the top left and old into the bottom right, but there's clearly some nuance there. Um, now remember, we, this, is, this is what you see when you pick a particular uh, value of k. Anyone have intuitions for what would happen if we, if we, if we adapt that number? Well, what should happen if we increase the number of neighbors? So think of it as like the, 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 the circle around each of these points uh, growing and including more observations that help determine the class that you assign. Any intuition about what would happen just visually? Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, it'll start to look smoother basically, right? So you'll get sort of less fine-grained structure and more coarse structure. And we can test that very easily. We'll go up here and let's say we pick 30 as, or 40 as our uh, neighborhood size. And yeah, so it does. It starts to look more linear and you see very few patches sort of out in space. Um, and the opposite presumably is true if we increase or if we decrease the neighborhood size, let's say we use only the two nearest neighbors, it now should look much more patchy. And it does, right? So you'll see, for example, over here, um, these two observations or three observations are surrounded by a bunch of, of red points, but somehow still the classifier decides that if you're in this part of space, you're going to get labeled a, uh, a, a, a old, right, based on your personality. And the same is true over here. What's that? Is it a leave one out? Uh, is it a leave one out? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's I mean, every point is in, 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 evaluated independently, right? So you I mean, with reference to all the, the entire training set. Um, now, when that gets large, then you may do some approximations, but yeah, the, the, yeah every point is looked at individually. Um, um, now, you might look at this and have some concerns, right? So, so just intuitively, you might say, well, this is a, it's a little weird to say that, like, you know, in this part of the space, um, you think someone is young, but then you move from here to here, even though, like, the, the mass of the observations are there, and, like, anything in this point gets labeled old. Or you might think, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And if you have that intuition, your intuition is that the model is overfitting. And we'll talk much more detail about what that means and, and how to counteract that. Um, you might also have the opposite intuition where we were over here. Right? You'll notice that this is almost too smooth, um, that you're missing lots of pockets where there are actually quite a few, maybe, like maybe close to the boundary. There are quite a few observations, and maybe it doesn't do quite as well as it should because it's got this really large neighborhood. Um, and we'll talk more about, about that. Um, you probably also want to have some quantitative metric of how well you did. It's not sufficient just to say this looks good, even though it does look like it's doing something reasonable. And so we can again use uh, the score method, which by default, in this case, uh, will just for KN and most classifiers, will use mean accuracy. So it's just telling you what proportion of points were correctly classified. And you might say 75%. That's pretty decent. Um, but there might be some nuance. For one thing, I mean, you can see that the classes look reasonably balanced, right? But it often is the case that maybe like 90% of the observations are in one class. 
And then 90% accuracy is not that impressive because you would get 90% accuracy just by saying everyone is in the, the more, more common class. So there's nuance there. And there's different ways you could look at that information. And scikit-learn uh, gives you a bunch of utilities uh, for, for doing that. So um, one thing that can be quite helpful is the classification report. So the little utility that quantifies precision, uh, recall, the F1 score. So I will probably butcher this too. I was, the precision is the, uh, is the, somebody help me out, it's the proportion of, uh, 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 it's, it's a recall, it's, it basically hits, right? Somebody? Precision is, yeah. and recalls false alarms or one minus false alarms? Okay, that, you can go look up the definition. Um, I don't do much classification. I don't actually do that much machine learning, period. Um, another thing that, that would be quite helpful is the confusion matrix. Um, so here we're looking at how, how observations actually get assigned. So um, if you know someone is, is or, so if you take all the young, the, the people who you know truly are young and observe how they're actually assigned, uh, it turns out that you know, most, of, we've seen most of them are correctly uh, uh, assigned. But in this case, it's maybe like 20% are misclassified and labeled old. This is, you know, this can be more helpful when you have more categories because then you can observe patterns where like one class is easily confused with another, and that might give you some intuition that you know maybe these these labels are not that distinct, or maybe there are some dimensions that are not useful, or you need to add features that discriminate between these particular classes. Um, so you have different ways of looking at um, at, at, at uh, performance accuracy. So those are the two sort of big classes of uh, supervised learning problems. You have uh, regression problems and classification problems. Questions? All right. Let's talk a little bit about unsupervised learning, uh, but not much because there's a lot of stuff I want to get to. So I mentioned already that, that anytime you have the ground truth and you can use that to generate the model's predictions, uh, you are in a, a, a supervised learning setting. But often you don't have that information. Sometimes someone hands you a bunch of data. This is, for example, almost always true in the context of neuroimaging data, right? Um, if you're trying to, to predict task, great. But often someone just says, look, we have a bunch of functional connectivity data. What does it mean? I don't know, right? I don't know. Pierre knows. No. Um, nobody knows. Um, and the, the question is, how do you extract structure from that, that sort of often high dimensional uh, uh, morass. And so let's start by taking a very simple example. It's not high dimensional. We'll use scikit-learn's uh, make blobs utility in the data set module. And we'll generate three clusters. And uh, these are fairly well separated by design, right? So you have these three clusters. Now, if I hand you this data and tell you nothing else and ask you what's going on in the data, you are probably going to very quickly say, oh, yeah, there's three clusters there. But you don't know that, right? I didn't tell you anything about what this means. Uh, your visual system is just very quickly grouping these and saying it looks to me like there's three distinct clusters. But um, you don't know, and that's the challenge, right? Is you're trying to extract structure when you don't know the grand truth. And there could be many very sensible ways to carve up a particular, uh, a particular set of, of data. So we have that data, and let's say we want to we uh, uh, cluster this. Um, what do we do? Um, so again, we have plenty of options. In this case, we'll use scikit-learn's k-means implementation. Uh, k-means is a, a very widely used clustering algorithm um, that just I mean, tries to minimize the, the within cluster variance, right? So for some fixed number of clusters, let's say, you know, I know there are three clusters in the data. Um, it is going to find the, the centroids and assign um, uh, data individual points to clusters that minimize the amount of variation within those, those, uh, those clusters. Um, and so if we know there's three clusters, which of course we do in this case, if you allow yourself to look at the data, um, then you initialize the, the k-means uh, estimator. The only sort of critical parameter here is the number, which is mandatory. Uh, again, you fit it. Notice the difference, right? So for unsupervised data, there are no y's. So the, the estimator does not accept a y. It wouldn't know what to do with it. It's just trying to find some structure in the data based on some, some internal estimation procedure. In this case, we're just coloring based on the predicted labels. And you look at that and say, wonderful, right? It, 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 it did great. However, um, what if you didn't know that the number of clusters was four? Right? What if you don't, you typically you don't know how many networks there are in the brain, for instance? Uh, and clustering algorithms generally will give you an answer, right, whether it's any good or not. So of course, if you had tried a different number, that doesn't look so good, but 
but the k-means clustering algorithm doesn't have an option. It doesn't have a stopping rule that says um, no, say I can't give you an answer, uh, uh, it's no good. Also, real world data generally don't look like this. So if we were to increase the variance of these clusters, right, so now notice, I mean, visually, we're only varying the standard, the standard uh, uh, deviation a little bit, but notice that, that visually this is a big change, right? This, this now looks to you to the eye like there's two clusters. In the real world, of course, adding a little bit of noise could very easily turn what are actually, you know, the underlying generative process might involve three clusters and a little bit of noise makes it look like there's two. So if you were to eyeball this and say there's two clusters, um, then the K-means algorithm might agree with you and say yes indeed, here you go, and you look at that and say wonderful, that looks good. But of course, um, that may be wrong. And of course, the, you know, the, the, the number of underlying clusters is indeterminate. Now, there's lots and lots of different ways people go about trying to identify the quote unquote right number. Um, you can make of that what you will. Um, if you think the underlying data is really high dimensional, like the data generating process really exists in sort of you know, thousands of dimensions, then you might want to say at some point, look, it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, this, these are just approximations, and maybe you find a number that looks good or is tractable. So typically, you know, it's interesting that in the concept of imaging, we always end up with like a small number of clusters. Nobody is really coming up with like 250 cluster solutions, unless you're talking about like whole brain parcellations, right? But, but um, if you're talking about, um, um, uh, you know, you know, nobody would ever postulate like the basal ganglia into 250 clusters, even though in some sense there probably have to be 250 things going on, right? So I think it's helpful to think about these things in science as sort of useful descriptive tools, right? Pragmatically, partially can do stuff for us, um, but it's a really big challenge to, to actually sort of try and approximate the data generating mechanism from the outside. And you see this even in the toy example, right? Where like we know, or we think we know, by hypothesis there are three things there. It doesn't take much for all these things to fall apart. Um, I have some other examples, a different notebook where you can sort of plot, you know, sort of simulate a bunch of neurons in the same space. And of course, if you imagine having like overlapping distributions of different neuronal populations that are very close in space, um, you can imagine how hard it is to try and pull those out unless you have sort of extra dimensions that really start to separate these things uh, in some way. Um, questions about unsupervised learning? Again, this is just sort of a very high-level overview. Um, okay. All right, so um, you might look at this now and say, well, okay, we've learned how to do machine learning to some degree, right? We've, we've developed fully operational machine learning workflows for three different kinds of problems, regression, classification, clustering. Um, we didn't do almost nothing, right? Like three or four lines of code in each case. Um, maybe we just pat ourselves on the backstop here. We could take the rest of the day off. You guys can all go home, right? Everyone knows machine learning now in addition to statistics and Python and everything else. Um, probably would not be a good idea. And uh, for several reasons. Um, one is that we really maybe ought to worry about the how, you know, whether the, the kinds of answers we've got here. So let's say we're satisfied with this answer. We think like, you know, 70, well, let's take the regression case. Maybe 11% prediction or, or the variance explained in age is wonderful, right? That's better than we had hoped for. Uh, we can sort of uh, just pack up and go home. Uh, maybe, but we could be fooling ourselves in various ways. And um, one way to see that is to ask um, the following question. If we think that you know, our, our, our estimators are learning from data, it stands to reason giving them more data would give us a better answer, right? I mean, it would be a pretty weird intuition to think that um, I hand you more data and your prediction gets worse. So as a sanity check almost, you might want to verify that when you take any of the things that we just played with and start handing them more data, they behave in a way that we would expect. And so what I'm doing here uh, is basically just running a little, uh, uh, a little loop over different sample sizes from this data um, the, well, also we use different sets of predictors, the domains, the fastest of the items, of three, or sorry, five, five predictors, 30 or, or 300, but that, we can ignore that. And I'm just going to generate um, uh, a learning curve, which I'll talk about in a little bit, which, which shows you the performance of the model as a function of uh, sample size. And that'll take a little while to run. Um, And the idea now is that, you know, intuitively, I think you might expect that model performance should improve, right, as you get more data. Uh, in fact, it does not. So you can also see that performance is better the more predictors you have. We'll come back to that. But, uh, but if you just focus on sort of the trajectory in all three of these panels, as you add 
uh, uh, observations. Intuitively, you might have expected that the model would do better. In fact, it does the opposite, right? Your predictions get worse as you add more data. What is going on here? Somebody? Right. Why, why is my R squared estimate for any of these panels worse when I have 10,000 people than when I have 100 people? Right. It looks like with 100, with, so over here it looks like if I have 100 people and I'm using 300 items, I can perfectly capture the, I make perfect predictions for age. And by the time I have like 50,000 people, I'm explaining you know, under half the variance. What is going on? Well, well so nobody says anything and everyone all at once. Uh, again? Somebody? Yes, right. We're overfitting to the small samples, right? So, uh, yeah, and then you all know this, or many of you know this, but, but this is, I think, an important point, and it's important to, to try to remind yourself of this pretty much every time you see an estimate, particularly when they came from a small sample size, right? Um, unless it's validated in some way, there is reason to think that it's probably overfitted. So what's happening here, conceptually, is it's not, it's not obviously that the model gets worse. The model was never that good, right? So this, as you sort of move out to the right, you're getting asymptotically an estimate of sort of the, the true, like the, the, the ideal model performance. And given infinite sample size, you know, the model would probably asymptote at some point. I mean, you can explain some of the variance. Um, it's just that when you have a smaller sample size, there's sampling error. So now, just by chance, your model is going to pick up on, or there's going to be variation in your data that the model can capitalize on, but that's not actually generalizable. It's specific to that sample you obtain and not to the population. Right? And that's the key challenge. And that's so the next notebook will be focused entirely on this problem and understanding this problem a little better. Uh, any questions before we go on? Okay. Uh, all right. So. Uh, overfitting and underfitting, and then we'll take a break. So let's start by uh, importing all the usual stuff. Um, we'll create a little bit of uh, data. We're just sampling from a noisy function where the underlying uh, function is quadratic. So um, with a small sample, it might look like this. So I've, I've deliberately chosen uh, fixed the seeds so that even you can see the, the, the curvilinear relationship there. Right? So we draw this sample. And now we know the, 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 the data generating mechanism in this case, but typically you don't. So somebody hands you this data, and the natural thing you might do right, in almost every domain of science, if, or you know, at least in psychology and neuroscience, you would take this data and you would immediately fit it with a linear regression. And so we do that, and we use scikit-learn, right? Initialize linear regression, uh, fit the data, and we plot that. In this case, we're plotting the mean squared error. And um, here's what we see. Okay, is that good? Right, it's clearly leaving, leaving something on the table, right? So it, it's clear that the, the model is underfitting the data, meaning uh, there's clearly patterns in the data that this model is not capturing. Why? Because it can't, it's not flexible enough. It's a straight line, and so by definition, it can't, it can't bend. So we need, uh, we need a model that can curve. We need a more flexible estimator, if you like. Okay, so we can come up with a more flexible estimator. An easy way to do that is to just start adding polynomial terms. So we can just, well, you know, we can, we can um, uh, fit a quadratic model, cubic, et cetera. And we might think, look, if a linear model is no good, let's just be safe, right? Let's go, let's go pretty far out. Let's take a 10th a tenth degree polynomial regression model and fit that. And then we're sure that this will be able to capture sort of the relationships we see in this data. So we do that. And actually, well, let me actually pause and introduce another nice uh, scikit-learn, uh, a piece of scikit-learn functionality, which is something called a pipeline. So a pipeline is a nice way of constructing pipelines where you can stack different uh, processing elements, uh, transformers, and then eventually an estimator at the end. And that allows you to basically automate a lot of these steps and write very little code. So in this case, what we want to do is we want to take that um, the initial uh, 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 x, these uh, x values, right? We're going to take that vector of, 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 of uh, predictors, um, and we're just going to add polynomial features, and we do that just by raising that that column to the the you know nth power. And so um, the square is going to give us a second column, and then we do it for the cubic term, and so on. And so we do this for as many degrees as we pass in here. And so if we call this function with degree equals 10, we will end up with 10 columns in our uh, predictor matrix. Um, and that is basically, so now we're doing polynomial regression, even though we're, we're fitting a linear model on, those, on that, the, those set of polynomial features. 
Um, so now let's let's do that. We we initialize uh, pipeline here. Oh, and sorry, just to kind of show you. So the way the pipeline is constructed, we take um, uh, we use this polynomial features utility, which is just a little piece of code that does what I just said. It just adds you know uh, uh, quadratic cubic terms, etc., uh, and stacks them in the matrix with the original variable. And the pipeline is constructed by passing in a set of steps. So a list of steps. Each step uh, is a, a tuple of two elements. So this is an arbitrary name. We're just giving it the name polynomial features. And this is an estimator or transformer. So here we initialize this, uh, this polynomial features thing. And this, the polynomial features thing, has a fit method, right? Or sorry, a transform uh, method. If you give it an X, it will give you back some transformed X. So a pipeline is basically a series of these transformers, and at the end you get an estimator. Um, so the last step here is, is going to be an estimator, and that's our linear regression step. And the nice thing about pipelines is that they behave just like estimators. So when you call the pipeline, you call fit and then predict on a pipeline, it's going to run through all these steps, culminating in the, the linear regression estimator at the end. Um, okay, and so... Um, Here's what happens when we fit the same data with a polynomial of degree 10. Uh, error has gone down quite a bit, right? By about 80%. How many people prefer the second model to the first? Nobody, right? Okay, somebody give me an intuition for why not. I mean, the error has gone down, so what's the problem? Yeah, so it's over but What does that mean? I mean, like, why, why is that a problem? I mean, the error has gone down. Right, yeah, exactly. So it's not going to generalize. The danger is like this explains this particular data set, but of course we don't care about this particular data set. The model is no good for us unless we don't typically care about the 20 people who came into our study, right? these 20 brains. We want a model that will apply and work well for the next 20 brains uh, for some population. And so this clearly does not do that in the sense that like it's hard to believe that if we had a score over here, if we, if we had someone come in the door, so here, right, someone came in and their score was two on whatever this variable is, that we would make a prediction down here. That seems very unusual, right? More likely, this is just because you have this extremely flexible model, and imagine, right, you're just sort of applying you know, pressure to the, the, the edges and sort of it bends until it finds its way through these, these data points, and it doesn't care about this space because it has no observations. There's no support there to keep it from, from doing all kinds of crazy things. Um, and so it, you end up with this thing, the training data. But if you had sampled some more data from the same exact distribution, uh, now it doesn't look so good, right? Now the same model uh, fails catastrophically because some of these data points are, are in, in, in parts of the space that previously there was no support, and so there was no sort of, the model didn't use that in any way when it was training. So you can see the tension between flexibility on the one hand and stability, right? So you want the model to be as flexible as it needs to in order to capture genuine patterns of the data, but no more flexible. And if we knew the ground truth, which in this case we do, and we, had, we repeat this with a quadratic model, that looks great, right? So now we have the best of both worlds. On the one hand, error is very low, but also this, it doesn't look to the eye at least like, like anything funky is going on. We feel fairly confident that if we had some new observations, they probably, you know, it's, it's nice and, uh, and smooth and yeah, everything looks reasonable, I think, here. Um, but again, we don't typically know this, right? This is, we can, it's, this is easy to simulate, but of course in the real world, um, we do not have access to the ground truth and the, the real challenge, this is one of the hard problems of, of working with data, is balancing overfitting and underfitting and, and so minimizing the total error for new observations. And doing that in a, in a systematic way is, is quite difficult. Because if we have a more flexible model than, than, we, than we, we should, the model will effectively hallucinate. So this model you can think of as essentially a human being who's a little bit paranoid and sees all kinds of patterns, right? Uh, this is a conspiracy theorist of a model. And this model up here is just really boring and doesn't, you know, it's very hard to convince it that there's anything going on. Like everything looks, yeah, that's okay, that's fine. Just put a straight line through it. Um, the reason I use that particular uh, um, analogy is because I actually think that is essentially what human beings do too, right? So when you sit down to analyze data, you are doing exactly the same thing as an estimator, right? as linear regression. Um, you will see some data that you didn't expect and you will chase that down. You'll say like, oh, well, I didn't expect this, but of course it makes sense that this two-way interaction occurs here. And then you, you put a model that captures that and you get some result. And you put it in your paper and you feel really confident about that, but you really should worry that you're doing exactly the same thing this estimator is doing, where you're seeing patterns in the data that could be signal, it could be noise, but you don't know. You can't automatically assume 
uh, that they're, that they're uh, signal. And the way we guard against that, obviously, is to get more data. And arguably, that's what we should all be doing in the, the human case, too. So um, I like to, call, to talk about p-hacking as just procedural overfitting, because that's what it is. Right? The only difference between p-hacking and this is that this is done by a machine, and the other one is done by humans. It's the same exact problem. And it's equally difficult to figure out what the optimal balance is. Right? Like, when do you stop exploring your data? Um, um, because you don't want to stop too early, but you also don't want to explore it so much that you sort of see things that aren't there. Um, any questions? Okay, so um, I made a little widget down here. I think, Elizabeth, you have to talk about uh, widgets tomorrow. Yeah? Okay, a little bit. So, I uh, mean, the code is there, you can look at it, but the, one of the things that's nice about the Jupyter Notebook is it makes it really easy to hook up any arbitrary function to uh, interactive uh, uh, sliders and so on. And so here, um, I, what I've done is just generated this thing you can play with. For some reason, I couldn't get it to work. Were the widgets working on the, they are? Okay, it wasn't working for me earlier, but that's good. Uh, so the idea is just to give you intuitions about, you know, overfitting. And one of the things you'll notice, of course, is that as you increase the sample size, uh, it becomes harder to overfit, right? Because the data, there's more support. At every point in this distribution, there's more data to guard, guard against the model just going off the rails. And so one, one lesson from this, and this is really why people in machine learning are really so emphatic about like large, large samples, is that you can afford to have a much more complex model if you have a lot of data. And you can even have an overly complex model, and the penalty is not, often not that bad. Like in this case, you can see that even with uh, a 10th degree model in this case, which is just which, you know, is unnecessary, uh, you still don't overfit that much. So the error in the test sample is pretty close to the training sample. There's a little caveat here, which is that if you started to go outside of the, the range of the training data, funny things might happen. Right? So th there's, there's some subtlety there, but at least within the boundaries of the original data, um, you can see that having a large sample or having less noisy data um, um, really helps you out. And if you're in a, a sort of low, low end scenario, which is quite common, unfortunately, in imaging, and the data are you know, fairly noisy, um, it's very hard to actually identify sort of the optimal point and actually still have a model that's flexible enough to capture the signal without also capturing a bunch of error. So you can play with that and then just like, it helps I think develop some intuitions. I should have pointed out, right, you're, you're fitting the data, you're fitting the model here and then you're applying it in the in new data sampled from the same uh, uh, underlying distribution. Uh, any questions? Okay. All right, so let's actually go, well, let's go on and, do, and start on validation, and then we'll stop in about, uh, t oh, actually, what do you think, Ariel, stop now or, or 10 minutes? I guess the coffee's probably not here, so let's, let's keep going. Okay, so that's the problem, right? The problem, and it, in many ways, it's, it's, it's one of the central problems when you're doing predictive modeling, is balancing um, uh, these two things, flexibility and stability. Uh, you want a model that's flexible enough, to capture patterns in the data that are there, but not so flexible that it starts to see all kinds of other things. It starts hallucinating. Um, and so the question here is, okay, we, we understand the problem conceptually, how do we actually go about uh, dealing with it? And so the next three notebooks I have here, you can think of as sort of three different ways of addressing the problem. Um, the validation approach doesn't actually solve the problem, but it helps you identify it, right? So the question really is, I mean, in order to, to be able to do something about overfitting, you have to know that it's happening. So how do we determine when we're actually overfitting um, our data? So we'll try to answer that a little bit. So we'll start by importing all of our, our usual stuff, including the data. And then we can talk a little bit about cross-validation, um, which I think is probably going to be familiar to many of you, right? So um, you've already kind of seen this, that like one really important insight is that an estimator is almost always going to perform, well, not almost always, but in expectation will it perform better when evaluated on the same data it was trained on than when evaluated on an entirely new data set, right? So if we, if we think back here, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, the error is going to be lower here than over here. And that gap will generally get bigger the more flexible the model is, the, more, the higher its propensity to overfit. Um, and so that kind of gives you, I think, a, a, a sort of a, a, an intuition for what you can do in order to detect that you're overfitting, is you can actually take these two things. You can take this over here and this over here and say, well, hey, is there a difference between these two things? And if there is, right, if you consistently observe that when you train a model on some data and then apply it to new data, you do much worse in the new data, 
then you're clearly overfitting, right? Something about your model is taking advantage of properties of the training data that don't actually exist in, out in the world. They don't exist in the population. Um, so one way to think about that is, um, you can just think of this as having two data sets. And so if somebody hands you a data set, like in this case we have our, our age data, let's say we have just a thousand observations, um, one very simple thing you could do is you could just treat that as if you had two data sets. You can, you can split that data into training set and test set. And scikit-learn provides us with a nice utility called train test split. And all it does is it takes the data you hand it and, um, well, it could be one or more variables. In this case, we're going to split both our x's and our y's. And uh, it splits it based on the proportion you ask for. So we say we want 50% of observations in the training set, and it will give us back a tuple, which is made up of uh, two, two, basically two variables for every variable we passed in. So we had items in age, so now we're going to get back two different variables for items, two for age, and we can just assign them, we'll call them items underscore train, underscore, items underscore test, so the training items, the test items, training age, test age. Right? And each of these data sets has 500 observations. We can verify that like that. Right? So we have 500 observations, 300 items, 300 personality items, those are going to be our features. And now we can take our, uh, still talking about our linear, linear regression estimator here, and we can, we can ask how well does this fit in both of these two data sets. So uh, we initialize our linear regression, we fit it to, uh, and notice this is the key, right? So now we're only fitting it to the training data. We're passing in only the training half. We ignore the other half for the moment. But we score it. Remember, the linear regression will give us the R squared, right? We're, we obtain the R squared for each of these data sets separately. So once we fitted it to the training uh, data set, we then use it to score the training data. And then separately, we use it to score the test data. So there's two, data, two separate data sets, 500 subjects in each. And now we can just print both of those. And uh, turns out, so I'll remind you, this is now we're fitting a linear regression in 500 subjects, predicting age from 300 items. If you only looked at your training sample, which is and it's still the case that in, in neuroscience and psychology, many, many people report results in their uh, papers that only report the R squared or some equivalent statistic from the model, right? Uh, you might think you're doing really well. You would say, hey, look, my model explains 83% of age. I mean, that's great. That's close to saying that like, you can predict someone's age. Uh, nothing other than knowing the, uh, the, having them fill out this questionnaire. Unfortunately, in the new data, which remember are sampled randomly from the same exact population, we are not doing so well. In fact, the R squared is negative. You might say, how could the R squared be negative? R squared is bounded at zero. It is not bounded at zero. Um, R squared, remember, uh, is, is defined as the, it's the ratio between the, the residual sum of squares and the total sum of squares. You can have a prediction that's so bad that the variance of the, the residuals is much higher than the actual variance in your data. So intuitively, you can think of this as saying that you would have been better off taking the mean age and predict, just predicting everybody has the same age and it's the mean age, right? That is a better prediction than our trained model. Our trained model is actually worse than, than what you would get just by saying everyone is, I don't know, 25 or something. Um, it can be arbitrarily, R squared can be arbitrarily large in the negative direction, but you don't want it to be less than zero. That's a, that is a bad sign. Um, so the main point here, of course, what we've learned is that our model is worthless, right? It's, it's worse than worthless. We can't predict age at all. We don't care about the 500 people we trained on. We want to be able to do this for, for other people. Um, okay. So that's not good. But the point is we were able to learn this because we had data, we, we train and test it on different data, and that's really, really important, right? If you want to understand how well your model is doing, you have to evaluate it on different data than you, than you trained it on. Um, now, that's a nice thing to do if you have lots of data, right? So if, I, if, if you have essentially unlimited data, wonderful, you can just take half, treat it as the training set, take the other half, treat it as test. The problem is we're often data limited, and this is definitely true in the context of neuroimaging. If you have, you know, an fMRI sample of, of 20 subjects, well, let's say even if you had like 50 or 100 subjects, you don't want to cut that in half, right? You're losing a lot of power to, to do whatever it is that your estimation process involves. So um, another insight that follows directly from that is, hey, what if we try to have our cake and eat it too? Right? So yes, we don't have the money to go out and get new data. That doesn't mean we can't use most of our data, uh, um, actually all of it really, for both estimation or both training and testing. We just have to be clever about the way we do it. And probably most of you have heard of Craig Fields cross-validation, so I won't belabor the point. The core idea is just that you take that training set, you split it into some number of folds, um, typically five to ten. Um, 
uh, but you know, could be anything up to the number of, of the, the, the sample size, in which case you're doing what's called leave one out cross validation. Um, and so you take, in this case, let's say 9 tenths of your data, you train the model, you test it on the 10% the you've left out, you take that performance estimate, set it aside, rinse and repeat. Use a different 90% to train, test on the 10%, leave that out. And then you take the average of those folds as your overall estimate. And so the, the beautiful thing about this is um, you've used almost all your data to train the model in every, one, every, in every fold, but you're never using the same data point twice, right? So you've used both the, all the data points for training and testing, but never at the same time. And so you have a minimally biased estimate of how well you're really doing. Um, why is it minimally biased? Why is it not unbiased? Right, so why, you know, why don't you get the, the, uh, the same answer having averaged over these folds that you would if you took the full sample and just repeatedly fit the model over and over again? So what's the difference between any of these folds and the full sample? Or sorry, any of these training data sets? There's fewer people. Right? The data set is smaller, so you have less data. So there's, nothing comes for free. You still, there is a cost to this, which is to have less data to estimate uh, or to fit your model. And so you're going to generally, and again, it's not, there's no, it's, not, it's not guaranteed in any sense, but, but in general, you will, on average, tend to produce estimates actually a little worse than they would be if you were using the full sample over and over again. Um, now, just to kind of show you how this works, I've, I've sort of written out the splitting or the k-folds validation procedure explicitly. Um, you can go through the code. I mean, it does encode exactly what I kind of mentioned over here. Um, fortunately, you don't have to do this every time you want to cross-validate a procedure uh, because scikit-learn, like so many other things, provides you with nice utilities that do this for you. And so. Um, if you want to do uh, cross-validation of any, almost any procedure in scikit-learn, you don't have to, oh, actually there's several levels of sort of, there's several layers in scikit-learn. Not only do you not have to do this, there are utilities that will sort of generate the, the training and test observations for you, so you can sort of get five different sets of indices, training and test, that's sort of one level of abstraction, it's a little helpful, but if you really don't like to write code and you want to do just like the, write the least code you can, there's this cross-val score utility uh, that you can use that just wraps any estimator and it will do that all for you sort of quietly behind the scenes. And so here we're importing this cross-valve score procedure. Let's say we want 10 folds. Um, we've, again, we're using a linear regression model. And so now notice we call this cross-valve score function and we're passing as the first argument the estimator. It could be any estimator. In this case, it's, like a, it's a linear regression. Um, we pass in our, our x and our y and the number of folds we want. And what we get out of this is a cross-validated estimate. So internally, it's doing everything that, that I wrote out explicitly here. Right? It's doing this. And it's giving you back just this quantity. It's giving you back just the cross-validated uh, R-squared estimate. And now, notice um, the cross-validated R-squared in this case is, is uh, on average 0.3. Why is, it, why is it substantially better than, than this? Uh, sorry, than, than this up here. Right. Why isn't it like worse than chance, essentially? Right. I mean, it's the same data. What's the difference? So the cross-validation procedure is not magic, but, but and I can just mention this. I mean, there's one big benefit to doing cross-validation as opposed to splitting our data set in two. Yeah, more samples, right? So now in every fold, we have 900 people, 10-fold 10, 10 split. We have 900 people, not 500. And so that ratio between observations and variables was unfavorable in the first case. We had 500 observations, 300 variables, and it turns out in this case that that, that increase in sample size helps us a lot, right? So once you, you know, at a certain point, the, 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 the fact that the model is, is so complex is now outweighed by the fact that we have all these degrees of freedom in our data set. And so given enough data, a complex model will start to do better and better, right? At the limit, if you have infinite data, you could have a model that's as complex as you like. Uh, and so there are multiple benefits, but the, the key thing point here is you also know how well, in some sense, the model does. I'm going to say sort of, uh, it's, it's not sort of, it's not a completely unbiased estimate, but it's a, a much better estimate of how well you would do if a new sample of people walked through the door. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so 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 scikit-learn gives us a couple of utilities that we can use to sort of better estimate how our model would do as we vary certain things about the environment, either the the, the, the size of the data or the parameters of a model. And these are called the learning curve and the validation curve, respectively. So the learning curve, the idea is that we're observing how the model performs as we, as we sort of change model experience, which typically means the amount of data the model has to learn from. Um, 
And so all I'm doing here, this, by, this may not run. It's possible this will take a while. If, it, if you run into problems, you can always like reduce the number of subjects and see if that works. Um, it'll work on my machine, though, so I'll start running this. And so all I'm doing here is basically fitting the exact same model you've already seen, um, but doing it uh, for uh, data sets, well, different, different size data sets. So we're just subsampling from the full data set for you know, n equals 100, n equals 200, 500, and so on, all the way up to 50,000. And, um, and I'm doing that very easily just using, so here again, I'm initializing the estimator. Right, you've seen this before. And this learning curve utility is really powerful. You just give it an estimator, you pass in the x and the y, and you pass in the vector of training sizes, which we defined here. And it's going to run the same model several times for each of these, at each, each sample size, uh, with cross-validation, and give you back the results. Um, uh, it'll give you back the sample sizes that, that were used the training scores and the test scores. So now we can use that and we can take it and plot it in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a way that allows us to kind of see what's going on. But if you just want to look at like what do the training scores look like, um, the idea here is that the rows now reflect the training size. So the first row would be 100, second row would be 200, and the columns are the cross-validation folds. So I think we did five-fold, and so you have, uh, yeah, so this is performance, cross-validated performance um, for, you know, small sample and as it gets bigger, and you already saw this, right? So once again, notice that um, the, the performance almost paradoxically gets uh, smaller in the training sample. It looks like we're doing worse as we get more participants. But this is hard to kind of understand. You don't want to look at this, and so here I'm just making a, a little plot um, that shows you what this looks like visually, and it's much clearer. So now we're plotting not just, so before, right, the, I showed you a couple of notebooks ago, you saw this already. You saw that like, it looks like performance decreases with increasing sample size, which shouldn't happen conceptually, but, but that only happens in the training set. In the test set, you see the opposite. And that's probably captures in your intuitions, right? The model should always do better as you get more data, assuming it's, 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 um, uh, uh, it's sampled from the same underlying process, right? Um, as long as the sampling is stationary, there's no reason why a model should ever do better in, or worse in expectation as it gets more data. Um, unless you have a, a particularly, you know, since there's something odd about your model. Um, and so what you care about in most cases is the green line here, so it's this bottom line, right? So, uh, and you can see the problem with small samples, right? So you can see that if, you're, your goal, if you're trying to predict age, in this case from these 300 items, you basically can't do that. You can't do that at all if you have a sample in the order of like 100, 200, and depending on what you think is good, you know, you might not be happy until you're well into the thousands. Um, and so this is a nice way of presenting that information because it gives you a sense both A, of how well your model is doing in terms of generalizing to new samples, but also how it's responding to changes. And you can sort of get a sense often just by like where that might ask them to it. You might say, well, it looks like, you know, I'm still getting a lot of bang for my buck if I increase the number of uh, samples, right? Like if you, if you were like, if you imagine like just stopping over here, you might think, well, I'm still, I'm, or sorry, if you looked at, you know, if you, well, let's actually, so if I just chop off the x-axis, um, at like a thousand, you might look at this and say, well, it looks like performance is still increasing and maybe I should worry about getting uh, more subjects. That's one kind of point. Um, um, but the key point, as I said, is that, is that this pattern is illusory. It's just because we're overfitting in our training sample. And this gives us a cleaner, a better estimate of how well our model is actually doing. Um, now, another thing you'll notice is that these lines are starting to converge by the time we're out here, like 50,000. They're basically on top of each other, right? Um, and that you could see as an indication that maybe we should consider increasing the flexibility of a model. So one way to think about this is if you have so much data that your performance is the same in the training sample and the validation sample, then arguably you could now use a more complex model, right? There might be sort of still information in that, in that data that you're missing out because your model's not complex enough to capitalize on it. So it's, it's an interesting kind of, um, there's this trade-off, right? You tend to think of like overfitting as a bad thing, but the presence of overfitting, or sorry, once overfitting goes away, you might almost want to induce more overfitting, or you might want to sort of add model complexity because you know that there might be, or you don't know, but you suspect there might be more variance that a more complex model should, should capture. So this would be a good, if you're out here and you have this amount of data, this would be a good situation maybe to think maybe I should experiment with a more complex model and see if I can capture more information rather than just using the simple linear model. Um, okay, question came up um, right after the break. I've used the terms training and test. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about validation sets. Um, in the interest of time, I, won't, I don't want to kind of go into detail, but the short answer is 
Yeah, in an ideal setting, you should have, if you have enough data, you really should have training, test validation, and this kind of lays out that, the idea of having sort of a true holdout, right, where you don't, there's a data set you'd never look at, and that's sort of really your sort of, when you're ready to publish the paper, it's like a, you know, like a, a vault you only unlock once, and you look at it, and you get the, the estimates, and you put that in the paper, and the rest of the data is both, is, is gets split into your training and validation. So I wrote a little bit about that. Um, but for present purposes, when I say testing data, just be aware that depending on context, people might refer to that as validation. It doesn't really matter much for our purposes. The key point is that there's some independent or almost independent at least data set that you're using to get much less biased estimates of how your model does. Um, okay, so that's, that's the, the learning curve. Um, um, and so that, that's nice because this, this general approach and cross-validation in general gives you a sense of how well you generalize to new data. But there's a really, really important caveat to that, which I think is, is not, not sufficiently widely appreciated. The fact that, that you might get this kind of convergence, right? So you might naively say, well, look, these curves converge, which leads us, to, so we know or feel confident that we're not overfitting. This is a good estimate of what, how well our model will do if you took some more data from the same process and, and, and applied the, 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 the trained model to it. However, it is almost never the case that you actually get to sample data from the exact same process, right? Like if you are, let's say, doing some kind of clinical prediction, you have a data set from this hospital that this physician obtained and this diagnostic lab extracted, and your hope is that that's similar to something that comes out of a different lab or something that a different lab, right? But it's not. It's never exactly the same population. So in some sense, this is kind of an artificial, idealized situation. You can pretty much always guarantee that performance when you take data trained in one model in, in one context, is, it's very likely at least the performance will, will be worse than you expect because there's more varying than just the particular individuals. It's not just new people. It's also a slightly, at least slightly different context, sometimes quite different context. And this is why we don't, despite, you know, like, despite the fact that we now have like many papers saying, and let's assume that the cross-validation is rigorous and no one's cheating. Um, there are papers that I think plausibly can argue, yes, we can predict, you know, autism with like 98% accuracy. And it's not that that's wrong, it's that it's context dependent. There's features that that model is picking up on. They could be real features, but they're not, general, they're not things about autism generally. They're, they're things about the way autism is expressed in this particular sample, in this hospital, and the, the kinds of people who come in, right? And then you try and test this model in a different hospital and it's worthless, right? There are other problems besides that, but, but, but one thing to be aware of is that you know, generalizing a new sample from the same population does not guarantee in any way that you'll generalize to an entirely new um, uh, context, or even slightly new context. And so one way we can kind of approach this is to cross-validate not just over, and this actually ties to the question at the back, right? Um, what do you do when you have like time points? So how do you generalize when you have like, you know, so I won't talk about time because it's complicated, but the general principle here is if you want to generalize to some new, um, and, and, and like in generalizability theory, we call them uh, facets, right? So a different level of some facet, like let's say uh, the research site, um, and you have variation on that facet in your, in your, uh, in your design, in your data set, then cross-validate over that. And so in fMRI, we often do this, for example, over subject, right? There's many ways you could cross-validate. You could cross-validate over runs within subject. You could say, let's train on one run, test another run. Um, fine, but no, doing that well doesn't guarantee that the model will, will perform well when you take it and apply it to new subjects. So you can say, well, let's validate on new subjects. And it's the same principle, right? If you want to generalize over different contexts, then you should explicitly uh, basically do the split in a, in a structured way so that you're partitioning on some, some, uh, some factor you care about. So to give you an example of that here, uh, we might think about age and say, well, okay, so we have a model that looks like it predicts age reasonably well. So I didn't really emphasize this a lot. Let me just point out, right? With 300 items, you do much better. So if you, if you ignore sort of, you know, simplicity and notions of like the big five or special or something, you just say, let's build a predictive model from these 300 items, forgetting, you know, we don't care what they are, what their weights are. Uh, you can explain, you know, over 40%, almost 50% of the variation in age just from personality items, which you might think is pretty good. Um, now you might say, okay, so we have a model that, that predicts age reasonably well. All we need is people to fill out this 300 item questionnaire. But um, the sample is heavily skewed towards English speakers. And in particular, you can see if we look at the, the where, where people uh, live, um, two thirds of it are from the US and then Canada, UK, Australia, et cetera. Um, account for most of the rest. There's not that many people from other countries that are not primarily English speaking. So you might say, well, okay, so we have this model. Does this mean that we have a model that for all of humanity 
well, at least with the English speaking part of it, they can fill out this questionnaire, uh, we can predict age. But we don't know. We don't know that. We haven't tested that. We can test that. How do we do that? Well, instead of splitting over just subjects randomly, we can take countries. Right? So we can say, if we train a model in, let's say, the US, how well do we, do we generalize to Canada? How well do we generalize to Singapore, to France? And that can actually, you know, setting aside sort of the machine learning problem of just knowing how well you perform, this can actually be really theoretically informative, right? This can lead you to ask interesting questions like, is the relationship between personality dimensions and age the same? Is it roughly consistent across different cultures? And so what we're going to do here is, is answer exactly that question. So first we split the US data in two so that we can make sure that the training and tests give us sort of roughly similar estimates. Um, and so that's all, you know, all, all this up to here is just a variation of what you've seen. We're just going to uh, score the model both in the training half of the US and the test half. And then we're going to take the model that's, that's always trained only on US data. And we're going to take all countries that have more than 500 observations, just so we can feel reasonably good about that, that, uh, that uh, performance estimate. And we're going to loop over them and apply the model and see how well it, it does in these other countries. And so first of all, you'll notice that we're basically kind of, we, we, you know, it's a little simple linear model. We have way more observations than, than uh, variables. No surprise, we do just as well in the test sample, no difference. So there's no overfitting going on there. Uh, how about other countries? So these are sorted by performance. And you'll notice that it looks like, and, you know, people have said this, I'm Canadian, so, you know, don't say this, I can say this. Canada and the US are basically the same country. So it, that's reflected, right? Personality, the relationship between personality and age is the same, basically, in the US and Canada. It's essentially the same in Australia, New Zealand, UK, all of these Western English-speaking countries, okay? Uh, then something funny happens. It's not so good in the Netherlands, but still, you know, you can still predict age reasonably well. But by the time you get down to these Asian countries over here, zero. Model is worthless. You cannot predict age at all in India, Singapore, Philippines, Thailand, given scores. Now, there's, I think, a fairly interesting theoretical question here, which is, why is this? And there's probably many reasons. Two kind of fairly obvious explanations are, one, it could be a language issue. Right? So maybe what this is telling us is that in countries where people uh, maybe don't speak English uh, natively, the responses are just not very good. Maybe it's a reliability issue. We shouldn't, and that might lead you to think we shouldn't use these responses if we're analyzing personality in relation to other things. That's one interpretation. Alternatively, it could be that the relationship is actually different, right? There's some cultural difference that leads personality to predict uh, age differentially. And one reason, this is very speculative, but one reason you might suppose it's the latter is that Singapore uh, is, you know, is, English is one of the official languages. Most people speak English fluently and uh, no relationship. So it might lead you to think there's actually some cultural difference. And then you might go and explore this in other ways. The key point I'm making is just that the fact that you, you know, this cross-validation up here assured us that if you sampled from exactly the same population, you're still doing pretty well, is no guarantee whatsoever that if you vary something systematically, and it could be something fairly small, in this case it's not, right, this culture is a big factor, um, it could be that the whole thing falls apart. Now, but the nice thing is you can use the same framework so long as you have variability along that dimension, you can use the same framework. So, you know, like in an industry context, you might say, uh, well, you know, if we have data from four markets and we're thinking of introducing our product to a fifth one, and we want to have a rough estimate of how well does our model predict how well we'll do in this new market we haven't seen, cross-validate over markets, right? Take like the, I don't know, 20 places you've done business and repeatedly split them into sets and t test, train on some and test on the other. In the context of uh, fMRI, you, you could say, uh, let's get a group of investigators at six institutions and then we'll cross-validate over institutions. So we'll test on five or train on five, test on one, and, and so on. And in a sense, certainly for anything clinical, right, this should be like a base requirement for anything to actually make it to the clinic. I'm not saying you have to care about this kind of, of generalization, but if you want to have a classifier that, you know, uh, discriminates faces from houses in any, you know, not any, but, you know, you could apply it in different cases, you really want to show that you can send that classifier halfway across the country and people can apply it with a different scanner, different population, and still get something reasonable. Yeah, Sam. I'm trying to understand the relation to like more traditional Yes. Uh, in the context of like, if I want to cross validate, say I want to cross validate mm -hmm. across the city yeah. or something like mm -hmm. that, how many types of stimuli do I need to be able to say that I'm generalizing yeah. across the city? Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. So there's, 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 two, there's two kind of points that, that I'll address. So one is, like, what is the relationship with like statistical, like classical statistical inference? You can think of this as conceptually doing the exact same thing as random effects, right? So there's a sense in which when you talk about cross validating over a country, that would give you sort of roughly, you know, wouldn't give you the same answer, but it would be the, roughly the same as having a variance component 
that treats country as a random effect. And you could also look at interaction center. So conceptually, that's the relationship. And if the question is, how many do you need? Then from a classical inference perspective, uh, use generalizability theory. Generalizability theory is a framework that lets you model variance components, and then you can estimate what would happen if you, you know, if, if you were applying this. So they have the distinction between like decision studies and you know, so a decision study would be so where you would apply the the model you've learned, and so it allows you to do things like say, hey, if we want to apply this model in uh, this population, we can ignore these other facets; they're no longer of interest. How many sites do we need in order to know that we have? And you can get a, a generalizability coefficient that tells you that exact thing. Um, and it's, yeah, so if you can if you can do that, then in some ways you could argue the classical estimate is sort of maybe a better way to go because it, you know you, you can model multiple things at the same time. Um, but I'm glad you asked it. And there is so the, you can, for you know for at least for this issue, there is sort of a, a direct analog in sort of the, the inferential statistics world, which is mixed effects models where you treat the thing you want to generalize over as random effects. And so the the principle here would be, and this is actually a problem that's very uh, dear and near, near to my heart. Um, is that we should actually all be fitting models that have many, many more random effects than we do. So you can approach that this way, cross-validate over all the factors that are varying, see if your model works, right? If you train on males, does it work for females? If you train on young people, does it work for old people? Um, or you could build a model that has random effects, right? That models all these things as random effects, age, gender, et cetera. Um, so conceptually, you can address these from both perspectives. Uh, good question. Any others? Other questions? Okay. Um, all right, so yeah, so the, the key point is just worry about generalizability, right? There's no, there's no sort of, um, th th there's no guaranteed way to know unless you actually evaluate it whether a model is going to generalize beyond what you, the context you've studied in. It's, it's worth thinking about and trying to, to assess directly. Um, okay. All right, good. So I think we're, we're good on time. I was uh, hoping to get to the fifth one here, model selection. So we'll, we'll definitely get through this and possibly even uh, dimensionality reduction. Um, all right. So, right. So, so so far, my argument has basically been um, do some validation so that you know there's a problem, but nothing actually that doesn't solve the problem, right? So, so like, you know, in like a Freudian sense, awareness is not, you know, it, 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 well, it's not like Freud thought, right? Knowing that there's a problem doesn't magically make all the problems go away. Now you just know that you're wildly overfitting. What do you do? And one solution that people like to suggest is go collect more data, which is great when you're doing online surveys. Not so easy when you have fMRI data right, or other neuroimaging data that costs a lot of money to acquire. And so, if there's some other way, we, 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 other some other approach we can use to obtain better estimates, then that might that would be nice. If there's a way to come up with with better models to select models that improve our predictions without having to acquire uh, a huge amount of data. So again, we'll start with our imports here, and um, we'll import our data. And so. Um, a really, really sort of important pair of concepts that ties very closely into some of the things we've already talked about is, is the, the idea of the bias and variance. So I talked about the trade-off between overfitting and underfitting, right? Or flexibility and stability, sort of the same, the same idea. That you can have uh, an estimator that's sort of more flexible and it, will see st it can capture more patterns in the data, but it also will see patterns that are, aren't there. It'll hallucinate. Um, and a more stable estimator is less likely to go off the rails, but it misses out on stuff that might be there. And those concepts are very closely related to the idea of, of, the ideas of bias and variance. Um, and if you understand the difference in bias and variance, then you can start to, to kind of think about um, how you might sort of uh, select better estimators by sacrificing one for the other. So um, this is the classic way to represent this. Right? So the idea here is, I think this is very intuitive. The idea is that bias is sort of systematic deviation from the estimator's central tendency. Um, so if you look at the, at the top row here, um, uh, I'm sorry, and variance is just the amount of, or, or, sorry, I'm sorry, the variance is the amount of scatter around the central tendency and bias is systematic shift relative to the, the ground truth, right? So what, what are the estimates sort of consistently falling? And so in this top left, left you have a, a low bias, low variance example. Um, that's where you want to be. So you want to minimize error and obviously if bias is low and variance is low, that's good. That means you've got a good prediction. Um, and by the same token, if you're like over here, this is really bad. Right, because you have highly variable responses, but they're also not even, you know, you're, you're never hitting the bullseye. You're pretty much out somewhere else, and there's tons of scatter. Uh, it's less clear which of these is better in some sense, right? So there's, there's sort of a difference here. Here you have tightly clustered observations, um, so the variance is low, 
but there's a systematic bias, a systematic shift from where you might think of as like the, 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 the true or the, the, the target position. And here the opposite is true. There's no bias, but there's, there's a fair amount of scatter around that. So this hopefully just captures the intuition. Um, um, now, it does not have to be the case that these things, they don't have to trade off against each other, but they will tend to. Um, and the idea here is that you can often decrease uh, the variance of an estimator by introducing some bias, right? So it's really easy to see this at the extreme. Here's a really biased estimator that has no variance. You're predicting age, everyone has the same age, everyone is 20, right? Zero variance, right? Everyone has exactly the same score, but of course it's highly biased because it's very unlikely that that's actually capturing the, 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 the I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's a bad prediction, right? The, the total error is gonna be pretty large. Um, so, you know, you go to one extreme or the other, it's very easy to see that, that you can easily get uh, an, an estimator with no uh, variance uh, just by introducing bias. Um, and that idea, again, has, has sort of a, a, a deep connection to the, the notion of overfitting or underfitting. Um, the high variance uh, or low bias estimator is a flexible one. So it has the capacity to end up in lots of parts of the parameter space. It can see all kinds of complex patterns of the data. Um, but that makes it more likely to overfit because it has to explore this gigantic space. And so odds are, at least some of the time, it'll end up settling in a part of the space that it should not be in. On the other hand, a high bias estimator, if you think again of the, some parameter space it's exploring, if, if you're basically saying, hey, you can't actually wander throughout this parameter space, you're kind of, you, you, you're sort of being attracted over to this part of the space. Uh, you don't get to, you know, explore, uh, uh, you know, eighth degree polynomials. You're we're sort of constrained to having a linear fit. Um, then that model is not going to end up um, sort of chasing phantoms very often, but it also will tend to underfit because it can't capture patterns that are really there. So these are all sort of intimately connected concepts. And one kind of key point here is that if you're coming from a scientific perspective, you'll all often think of bias as just a fundamentally bad thing, right? In like classical statistics, people often talk about like bias, bias is bad. Uh, you want to avoid bias. Does not have to be the case. So think of bias as just a systematic shift. And there may be lots of cases where by introducing a systematic bias to your estimator, you can actually reduce the variance more than, than the bias costs you in some sense, right? So what you care about typically is actually total error. You care about the total deviation of, uh, let's say here, uh, of these points from this. Let's say this is the truth. You want all these points to be here, right? And so if you have, like, you can, this is a sort of contrived example. You can imagine, like, if you knew someone was, uh, had, like, some weird, weird sort of, their motor control system was a little funny, and you knew that if you just told them to, 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 like, throw a little bit to the left of the bullseye, all of a sudden all the responses cluster. But if you tell them to throw straight at the bullseye, you get this you might argue that maybe this is better. Right? Maybe you want that person to be a little biased because it's reducing the, they might get a better score. Right? It could turn out that somebody actually given those instructions uh, can actually score better playing darts um, just because of the nature of their, their, you know, uh, their motor system. Um, here's maybe a, a more intuitive example. Uh, I get on a plane to go to some conference. I park my car at the airport for three days. I come back, uh, where's my car? Two strategies I could use, there are others. One is I could rely on my memory. I, I say, well, I remember, I know what my car looks like. I remember I parked it like roughly in this area. I'm going to walk around only and then, you know, I'm going to patrol like a few rows and look for my car. Alternatively, I could say, well, I don't know. I'm just going to wander around the whole parking lot until I see my car. Which of these is the better strategy? What's that? You guys need to speak up. I can't hear any of the. <laughs> Sorry. OK. Uh, so, okay, so that's, that's one strategy. Yeah, so you, you might say you should, well, I mean, if you think you know where the car is, you should go there first, right? Okay. Is that guaranteed to, or even, is, you know, forget guaranteed, is, is, is that, do we have good reason to think that an expectation I will find the car faster? What does that depend on? Under what conditions would that not be a good strategy? Yeah, if, 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 my, if my memory is poor, which I, it is, actually then that's a terrible strategy, right? Because I might think like, yeah, I left the car over here and then I spend half an hour looking at that and I, I never find my car. Eventually I give up and I go for the high variance strategy, but I've wasted a lot of time. So this is actually the really, the, in some ways, this is really the central point of this whole tutorial. There is no such thing as a good or an optimal estimator, right? Everything depends on the match between the, the estimator, the, the method you're using to come up with an answer and the data you're using. And if the match is bad, then it's not gonna work very well. But, but there can be estimators that are fantastic in some contexts and absolutely abysmal in, in the others. In fact, there's a set of theorems in machine learning called the free lunch theorems that prove that, you know, over the universe of all possible data sets, not all existing data sets, all possible data sets, no estimator is any better than the other. 
which sounds wild, but all you have to do to kind of get the intuition is you know, take any data set you like, however well it performs, you just flip, you just invert, like if it's a classification, or you just invert the, the, the Ys, and now you have a new possible data set where that estimator would do really badly. Right? Um, and so you might say, okay, well, it's all hopeless then. No, it's not hopeless at all. It just means that what you need to know in order to pick out a good estimator, right, in order to have a good model of the, of a good predictive model, you have to know something about the data you're working with. Right? You don't care about all possible data sets. You care about the domain you're working in. If you know in this particular domain, working with this particular kind of fMRI data, these kind of models tend to perform really well, then you should use that. You, that's a bias you have. It's an inductive bias that you might want to rely on, rather than exploring a, this massive space of models. On the other hand, that could hurt you. It could be that you're wrong, right? Maybe there's something about this particular uh, data that is not like the data you've seen before, and then you screw up. So maybe if you don't have any good intuitions, uh, then you go high variance, and you just come up with some exploratory system that tries out lots of things in the hopes that it'll find some, uh, you know, some, some stable pattern in there it can rely on. Um, so that's the general idea, right? There's this, this really deep trade-off. And there is no sort of universal right answer. If someone ever says, oh, ridge regression is fantastic, or SVM is fantastic, what they're really saying is, given the kinds of domains I've worked in, the problems I've seen, the data I have, it seems to do better. But there is no such thing as like SVM is wonderful, or you know, deep neural nets are wonderful. It really depends on the problem uh, and, the, and the nature of the data that they're being applied to. Um, OK. Now, that was kind of a contrived example, right? But, but the principle is important that, that, again, if you have useful prior knowledge, if what the knowledge you have about a domain matches the world, then you actually want bias. Bias is good. If you don't, then, or if you have bad knowledge, then you should avoid it. Then you should use some kind of other exploratory strategy. Um, this comes up in the context of model or, or feature selection, which I think I talk about a little bit later, right? So let's say you have, most data sets actually have, like, you know, let's take the Human Connectome project, which you've heard about, just hundreds of variables you could use, right? Even with a sample size of 1,200, which you've already seen, may not be actually sufficient to predict things like age or personality super strongly. Um, um, you might not want to throw just everything in the model. Maybe you should pick features carefully. What do you use to do that? Well, your biases. Right? You might have good reason to think that some of these features are better than others. Um, so the principle here of introducing background knowledge into the model to predict or to improve uh, uh, predictions is called regularization right, in, in statistics and machine learning. So regularization just means you're, you know, you're making your predictions more regular, which means they're respecting some, some kind of information you have. Um, this has a very deep connection to Bayesian statistics for people who are familiar with Bayesian statistics. And in fact, for many, and actually I'll show you, for penalized regression, for example, uh, many approaches of regularization have a direct analog in Bayesian statistics. For example, ridge regression, which I'll talk about, is equivalent to setting a, a, a normal prior on the, the, the coefficients. Um, so, the, and, and conceptually, you should see this, right? If you know anything about Bayesian statistics, it's that there are priors. Same, same idea in, in uh, machine learning. It's just often implicit, but it's serving the same purpose. If you have good knowledge about the world, you think you have good knowledge about the world, you want to find some way to bias your estimates in a way that respects that. Um, so to illustrate that more formally, we can talk about penalized regression, which is one of the more, more uh, common forms of regularization. Um, often people coming from uh, science background, uh, at least social or biomedical sciences, think of like least squares as some kind of like magical default, right? Like that, that's sort of like the default method. And if you talk about bias, you know, like, like penalized methods or that are introduced bias, you need some special justification. Like you need to tell me why you want to introduce a biased method, right? It's not something you get to just like play with or try out. But there's actually nothing special uh, about ordinary least squares regression. Um, um, you know, often, typically what you care about is actually, well, I should, let me back up. What's special about OLS is that it's guaranteed to minimize the, the summer squared errors in the training sample, right, given a linear model. That is the guarantee. But you don't care about your training sample, generally. You care about the test performance. And so if someone says, hey, I can give you a biased model that will do a little worse on average in the training sample, but will do a little better on average in the test sample, that's the trade you might want to make, right? And you might say, well, how could you have that kind of, how would you be able to say that you might do better in the training sample? And the answer, again, is if you think you know something about the world or you have a method that, that sort of uh, introduces information into your estimate, then maybe that can help you. Um, and so that's exactly the motivation for uh, common penalized regression methods. So here is the standard least squares criterion, right? So this is the cost function for OLS, whereas you're just trying to minimize the summer squared errors. Right? So you want this, this quantity to be as low as possible. Um, that's what you're minimizing. 
you might have heard of lasso regression. Um, this is lasso regression. Notice that, that most of this is the same, right? So you have the same least squares criterion here, and then you're adding this extra term here, uh, which we call a penalty term. And the idea here is that the cost, right? So, this, so the, the evaluation of the measure of how good your, your prediction is, is based not just on least squares, but to some variable degree. And that's what the, 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 the cost parameter is doing here. Uh, in this case, it's the sum of the absolute coefficients. So you take the actual estimated coefficients, and you take the sum of the absolute values, and you add that to your cost, and that's the thing you're trying to optimize. Right? And this is fit iteratively, so you'd have to have some estimation algorithm that progressively reduces that cost, given that it's not now based just on this easily solvable uh, least squares criterion. Um, and that's called Lasser regression, which many of you have probably heard or used. There's a different variant on this, on this idea, uh, called ridge regression. And the only difference there is that instead of using the sum of, of absolute coefficients, you're taking the sum of, of squared coefficients. Okay. Um, and this may seem like a very subtle difference, like, you know, what difference can it really make that you have, that you add this at all, or that you have uh, the, the absolute, uh, sum of absolute coefficients here, or the, the squared coefficients, but actually changes the behavior in fairly dramatic ways, which we can explore. Um, so let's think about this conceptually in the case of the last year, right? What is it doing? What, what does it mean to add this penalty term? Um, well, the idea is we're saying that there's a cost to adding coefficients, right? So um, it's not just that, you know, so, so if imagine you had an infinite amount of data, right? That it would always be sensible to keep increasing variables in the hope that some of them will add some tiny amount of information. Uh, but as soon as you say that there's now this additional cost, that this is just the sum of all of the coefficients and all those variables in your model, it becomes expensive. Your model is now doing worse. You're penalizing complexity. You're saying, if possible, please drop uh, or please reduce the, the, the coefficients on at least some of your variables. And it turns out that this particular penalty actually has the, 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 the effect of zeroing out um, uh, variables, meaning if you keep raising this penalty, so raising this penalty will make this term proportionally more expensive relative to this one, so it'll start to be more important to maintain sparsity or to maintain sort of smaller values um, than to minimize the sum of squares, um, then what'll happen is you'll actually start to drop out variables in the model. So you're actually doing implicit feature selection. And that's one of the f powerful features of, of Lassen. It's why people like it, because it sort of sparsifies your solution. And so we can see that if we plot the coefficient paths here. Um, so this is a little function that just, uh, well, I'll show you the, the plot and then this will make a little more sense. Um, so what you're seeing here, if you haven't seen these kind of plots before, imagine you just take a slice through the x-axis here. These are your regression coefficients. And so if you were doing uh, just like ordinary least squares, the penalty would, would be zero. So if you actually just kept going that way, right, like you would basically come, you would arrive at a point where, um, and it's probably pretty similar to this, where these are the coefficients you end up with. So here's a variable that seems particularly important, the negative direction, uh, and so on, right? And with ordinary least squares, all variables have non-zero coefficients, always. But what the lasso does now, as you increase this penalty, as you increase the importance of this term relative to this one, uh, terms start, or, or, or parameters start to drop out of the prediction. And at a certain point, they'll all drop out, right? So if you make it so expensive to have any variables, then obviously the only thing to do is to say, you know, just have a, a, a constant model, right? Just, just the intercept and no variables because it's too expensive to have any, uh, any non-zero coefficient. That's bad. You don't want to have a constant prediction. But long before that, you'll get to some regime where you can see that there's a sparse solution. There's only a few variables left. So these variables will start to fall out. At some point, the penalty is such that you only have you know, however many you want, five, 10 variables left. And everything else has gone to zero. Why is that nice? Because you have a sparse solution. And we like sparse solution because they're interpretable. So now you maybe don't have to worry about, in our case, we have, I think this is a model with 30 variables. But maybe you're over here and you only have five left. And you think, oh, great, now I can make predictions with just these five variables. I can hold them in my head. Everything is lovely. Um, does, that, does that make sense to people? Any questions? We haven't talked yet about how well this does, but yeah. Conceptually, mm -hmm. the thing, the knowledge about the relative range here is the Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah, I, yeah, excellent point, yes. So, so when you think about it, it's the bias you're introducing. The inductive bias of the lasso is that the world is sparse. There are a few things that are important. Most things are not important at all. You're making predictions using a smaller number of, feature, of, of features than you started out with, right? That's the intuition. If you're right, you're probably going to do quite well with this. If you're wrong, you might do less well, and we'll see that uh, in, in a moment. Um, other questions? OK, so, um, okay so, so now we'll do the exact same thing for ridge regression. Uh, ridge, again, if you, if you look at the mathematical formulation, looks quite, sim quite similar, the difference being the shape of the penalty, 
But it turns out that actually makes it behave quite differently. And what you can think of this as doing is imposing a normal prior. So this, this imposes a Laplace prior where you want a few uh, strong variables. And this imposes a normal prior. It basically says, look, the data may tell you. If you just fit the data naively, it may look like there's some variables that are really important. Ignore that. Squash them all towards like a normal distribution, right? Everything should be smaller than you think it is. And just to come back to your point, what is the inductive bias of, of Ridge? It's that nothing is really important, right? Everything makes, the world is complicated. All the information you have is useful to some degree, but probably not as useful as you think it is if you have a small amount of data. So regularize by making all the contributions smaller than you would naively think they should be. And this is what happens to the coefficients as you increase the penalty here. It may look like these are going to zero, but they never are. Right? They just get smaller and smaller and smaller, and they bunch together more closely. And so the assumption here, the, the intuition at least, is if you're right about the, the fact that the variables you have um, generally don't carry much more information than one, than, right? no variable is much more important than the others, and if it looks like it, it's only because you're overfitting, then ridge regression will tend to do quite well. As an aside, I mentioned no model is, is perfect or optimal, right? In most, in many real world situations involving like psychological data, neuroscientific data, this seems like a good assumption. So generally speaking, and I think many people have argued, like if you have to make a generalization and you care about predictive power more than interpretation, in many cases, Ridge is gonna do better than Lasso within a fairly wide range of penalties. The benefit of, of Lasso is you get this extra interpretability or what looks like interpretability. There's a separate discussion to be had about whether that's real or whether it's just, you know, it looks good. Um, but that's the, the core the distinction. Um, idea, uh, questions, thoughts? Okay, so, but so far, notice we haven't said anything about how good like these, these things are in, in a predictive sense. This is just conceptually what happens to the coefficients. Um, now we can ask, well, okay, empirically, if we apply these, these two different variants of, of penalized regression to our data, what happens? And so um, here I just wrote a little function we can reuse just to plot the data. And now what we're doing uh, is introducing, or we're gonna use a, something called a validation curve. So the validation curve, uh, very similar to the learning curve, uh, except that in, in, instead of systematically varying the size of the data set, we're gonna vary one of the estimator's parameters. And in this case, we're gonna vary the, param the alpha parameter, which is the, the name of the penalty parameter, uh, what's lambda up here, in, in scikit-learn. So, um, remember that for linear regression, we initialized it uh, this way. All we have to do if we want to use the lasso regression model is, is initialize the lasso. Uh, where did I do that up here? Yeah, so again, so we, we also in the linear model module, so we import lasso, and then, um, and we, and then when we, when we uh, actually instantiate, when we initialize the, the estimator, um, it takes a variety of parameters, but the, really the, the key one, the one we care about in this case, is the alpha. One thing to note, this is gonna be, like the lasso and ridge are gonna be scale dependent. So if you have variables in your data that are on radically different scales, right, think about this here. If one of your variables is on a completely different scale, it's gonna have probably a larger coefficient, which means that will contribute to the penalty more. So generally speaking, unless you have really good reasons to think that variables on larger scales are actually more important, you should probably standardize all your variables before you apply these methods, right? They should all be on the same scale, typically mean zero unit, uh, uh, unit variance. Um, but so that's how we would initialize this and we would just vary this. And if we set this to zero, it's identical to least squares because the penalty is zero. Um, so what we're doing now down here, with this learning curve, um, uh, where'd it go? Uh, is, is uh, or with the validation curve, I'm sorry, is very similar to the, the uh, learning curve. We pass in the estimator we want to use, we pass in the X and the Y. Notice now the X is always the same, we're not changing the size of the data set anymore. This is the name of the parameter uh, in, the, in the estimator, so just to kind of make that really clear, if I initialize uh, a new lasso estimator, it has this alpha parameter. By default it's one, if I had set it to something else, it would reflect that. And so what we're, we're doing here in this validation curve is we're saying vary this thing systematically over this range. Um, and that range is given um, here, right? So we're varying between, uh, in, in, like, in log space, between minus three and one. Um, uh, and we're gonna fit the model for each, uh, for each of these penalties. And we're still using R squared as the scoring. So here's what this looks like. 
I don't know why I insist on, on like running the cell when the figure's already there. Maybe to make it look like I'm doing something. It feels like it's not. You know. um, okay, so, okay, so what are we looking at here? So now we have the penalty, which we're varying on the x-axis. So different model, right? Each of these, each of these gives you, shows you what happens for a different model. It's always uh, uh, lasts a regression, but with a different penalty. And you have the R squared on the y-axis. And again, we have training and tests for the lasso. We also have, for reference, performance for OLS. OLS does not vary. Why? Because there's no penalty, right? So that's just a constant over this range. Um, and again, you'll notice once more, right? So there's, there's generally going to be this large difference between performance and the training tests. You're still overfitting. It's not like magically guarding against overfitting unless you're in a, you know, a, 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 well, it generally doesn't magically make overfitting go away. Um, but here's performance uh, in the test set, which is what you care about. And now notice. And here's the cool thing, so I should mention, what we're doing here is we're taking 1,000 a a thousand, uh, subjects and we're using 300 items. So remember I said like this is a kind of a, 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 a suboptimal situation to be in with ordinary least squares because you have a lot of features and not a lot of data. But what the last is doing for us, it's actually dropping out a bunch of those features. So it's doing feature selection, which means we end up with a more favorable uh, uh, feature to sample ratio. And you can see that for this particular data set, and this is always dependent on the data, right? this is not a general principle, you get optimal prediction somewhere around here. Um, so where, where your penalty is like somewhere between 0 0.1 um, and 1, right? That seems to be, uh, for this data set, at least optimal. And so now you know that if you need to make predictions for data from the same population, maybe you, you, you do actually clearly do better uh, with uh, lasso regression model with this penalty than you would with ordinary least squared. Even though, again, it's biased, right? So this is a biased model. Um, it, on average, will give you a different answer. It, it will systematically deviate from the correct answer, but it will reduce variance so much that your sort of sum of squared errors is still lower than it would be if you'd use the sort of, uh, well, in the, relative to this less biased uh, model. And so if all predictions all you cared about you might say this is good and we should take this model. And the other benefit is in this case, you're actually also getting a sparser model than you are. So not only do you have a better predictive model in this case, you also have probably a more interpretable solution. And this is why people like Lasso, right? So if it's carefully tuned, you actually often get better prediction on top of it being more interpretable. Um, okay. Um, any questions? Uh, the other, one other thing I will note, mention, though, like notice that if you don't carefully tune, right, bad things happen. So this is it's not magic. Like if you didn't have enough data to actually estimate the hyperparameter in this case, um, or you weren't actually careful about this, you might end up picking uh, like a, a, a value of like 10 for your alpha, which is basically saying like the the it's, it's super important to have a sparse solution. And lo and behold, you're now doing like, you know, you're at zero. You're doing worse than ordinarily squares. So the, really the moral is, again, no free lunch, right? There's always trade-offs and you kind of have to know what regime you're operating in and be careful and smart about how you actually optimize the model parameters. Um, okay, let's do the same thing for, for Ridge, just so we can see what happens. Um, so one thing you might have said, just to kind of pause here for a second, you might have said, okay, it's doing better. And the reason it's doing better is specifically that it's dropping a bunch of variables from the model. And so you are retaining the models that are predictably useful, and there's many fewer of them. And so that's why you're doing better, right? It's because you basically are, 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 are uh, um, you're, you're, you avoid using up all these degrees of freedom in your data. Um, however, that's not the entire explanation, clearly, because in this case, remember, ridge regression keeps all the, the, the variables, right? It doesn't th throw anything out. And you'll notice that the ridge regression, you still are doing much better than, than OLS for a fairly wide range of penalty parameters. Uh, in fact, it looks like, I mean, you know, it's probably not meaningful, but it looks like, if anything, if, you're, if, if you really need to squeeze every last bit of, of juice out of it, right, you do a little bit better with, with the like, well-tuned ridge regression in this case than with, with uh, lasso. Um, even though here you have all non-zero parameters, just like ordinary least squares. So this is just as complicated, arguably more complicated, less interpretable, because all the coefficients are going to be closer together and more similar. So what does this tell you? It, it tells you in this data set, it's not actually the number of predictors. It's not that like some things really are super important and you get to ignore things that aren't. It's probably actually a, maybe a, a, a more reasonable interpretation is 
all of these variables are carrying like a lot of the same information, right? And so in some sense, you could do really well either by taking just a few of them and ignoring a bunch or by constraining the, the solution to, to pretend or to behave as if lots of things are important but only slightly and get information from lots of different sources. And this is not uncommon. It's actually fairly common to have this kind of situation where like both Lasso and Ridge, if they're well-tuned, will comp perform comparably and both are better than OLS. Um, Beyond that, you know, depends on the data and various other things. Um, now, one other thing I want to point out, I'm not going to have time to talk about interpretability. A couple of people, were, I think, are interested in having a discussion about this, so maybe next week we could set aside like, a, a, some time and talk about what does it actually mean when you get like, a solution uh, from ridge regression or SVM or anything else. Right? What can you say about the pattern of weights you see across the brain, et cetera? Uh, one point I will make here is, um, if you think it's a reasonable thing, if, if your, your sort of standard work approach involves to some degree looking at coefficients, like over here, and saying, oh, this one is really big, highly statistically significant, and these ones aren't, and that tells you something causally important about the underlying mechanisms, the fact that these do basically the same, equivalently well should really worry you, right? That that maybe is not such a good strategy, because over here, if we look at the penalty, we can go back up and see how many variables it's obtaining. It was like, uh, not many, right? So the last prediction in this case had probably like seven or eight variables. And that inter the interpretation of that model is going to be very, very different from this one, where all of these variables have non-zero coefficients, and they're probably actually not looking very different. They all look like, or many of them will look like they carry some weight. And so you're in this really odd situation, which unfortunately is a very normal situation to be in with real world data, where many different models are like predictively roughly comparable, but the internal structure, the internal solution looks very different, has radically different interpretations. And that should concern you, right? Because if you'd only looked at one of those and you think, oh, I can just take these like five coefficients from Lasso and I can say that this one is important and so on, um, you might want to rethink that or at least consider the possibility that that's, that's actually sort of an illusion induced by uh, the, the data in combination with the inductive biases of it, right? It could be that there's actually tons of information in the data. You can make an equally good prediction even with a radically different structure which is often the case. And, and so one way to think about this is, if you rerun the lasso, which is probabilistic, you might end up with actually, in some cases, a quite different solution that does equally well. So a different set, a different linear combination of variables might have given you equally good prediction, even though the interpretation seems quite different. Yeah, Sam. Something like this where you're varying the parameter. Mm -hmm. Is there any like, heuristic where you can look at a data, say my data is just mm -hmm. really wide, has yeah. like, way, way, way more features mm -hmm. samples or something like that? Mm -hmm. Should I just assume that I'm in a British grammar or something like that? Yeah, I think some combination of those things, right? So this, this came up earlier time. So, so those are the two strategies, right? You either use the data, so you can, you can obviously, so if you have enough data, you would just always, if you had unlimited data, you would always estimate all your hyperparameters from the data. And you could do that in a like, nested cross-validation way. Um, if you don't, which is, you, know, you never do, if you don't have much data, then you, I think you start to, you're forced to rely on intuition to some degree. Um, what you want to avoid, I think, is some unprincipled combination of those things where you, like, you take a small amount of data, you play with some, some, some uh, uh, parameter settings until it looks good, and then you say that works great. And of course, you've probably overfitted in the process of model selection. Um, so there, you know, again, there's, there's no free lunch. The problem is, that, yeah, in the process of estimating this, you also need, if you want to estimate this in a particular way, you're going to need more data than if you just had a good value to begin with. And you know, um, you're always using up some degrees of freedom, either in your data or sort of researcher degrees of freedom by exploring. Um, yeah. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Um, okay. So, um, yes, yeah, so I talked. I mean, I talked about lash and regression here. They're they're very commonly used. They're fast. Um, people are familiar with them. They have nice properties. But there's nothing terribly special about them. And as I mentioned, the scikit-learn has hundreds of estimators you can use, and it, generally they're as easy to plug in as just like copying and pasting a single uh, single um, uh, variable. And that's good, right? And that's part of the appeal of scikit-learn in some ways. But it's also dangerous because, of course, if what you do is, and people do this, right? You go and you try out 50 different things and you just report the one that worked. That's really no different from like running, uh, you know, 100,000 different analyses with linear regression and only reporting the one that worked with whatever set of covariates or choices you made. Um, 
there, nothing comes for free. You're always inducing overfitting every time you look at the data. And if, you, if you're rigorous about that and you sort of cross-validate properly, then you, the cost is you're going to underfit. Like the, there is no free lunch ever. Uh, everything you do has some cost somewhere. And the hope is that the benefits outweigh the cost. That said, obviously, there are lessons people have learned um, um, based on sort of experience, based on um, uh, mathematical principles and so on as to, as to what kinds of things tend to work better in which domains. And so you've probably, many of you have seen this, this uh, flow chart, uh, I think from Andreas Mueller, um, and the idea here is obviously this is just a heuristic, right? Like don't take this as gospel. But the idea is, you know, you start here and then like you ask how many samples do you have? Notice if you don't have, I mean this is also just a heuristic, right? If you don't have 50 samples, go get more data. And then are you predicting a category? Uh, if no, are you predicting uh, quantity? If yes, and so on. And so the, the kind of point is you get to some, some of the most common, uh, commonly used estimators pretty quickly. And this, I think, is a probably a reasonable heuristic, but it, there's no, obviously, guarantee that this will give you good answers. It's just some, you know, um, it might be helpful to explore some of these first.